21st century of energy with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Karen Alderman Harbert um, leads this institute efforts to building support for meaningful energy action nationally and internationally through public develop, policy development, education, and ad advocacy. And I have to say, I snuck a little bit of eavesdropping when she was giving her press conference earlier. And what impressed me, and I think will impress the rest of you, is her handle on how we, as the Bakken, are part of the nation's and the global's energy industry. And I don't think we say that enough to remind ourselves, even though we know it, but we need to remind ourselves and the people around us that we, in the Bakken and in North Dakota, are making a difference in the rest of the world. And so I'm very excited to hear from Karen and how the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Energy Institute for Energy is able to be here and talk to us about what's happening in the world. Thank you and good afternoon. I know you ate a lot, but good afternoon. Uh, you know, it's so great to be out here. First of all, it is great to be out of Washington, to be perfectly honest. And what a great view out here. I mean, it's just so nice. And it's nice to be out where people are actually getting things done. I guess I couldn't say that with the panel, the first panel this morning. But uh, it's terrific to be here with can-do people that are making a big difference, uh, to Maria's point, on not what's just happening here in your local community or your state, across the country, and increasingly across the world. Uh, I realize it's dark in here and you had a really delicious lunch, so I'm going to move around a little bit, try and keep it a little bit active. At the end, we'll take some questions, and if you don't ask me, I'll ask you. So hopefully that will uh, uh, encourage you to ask me questions to keep you guys off the hook. Uh, what I thought I'd do is, you've, you've heard a lot about, there's nothing I can tell you about energy that you probably don't already know, so I'm not going to try. What I'm going to try to do is help you think about it a little bit differently and hopefully validate a, a lot of your... Uh, well-deserved uh, appreciation for your own industry, and then maybe help us sell it a little bit differently, and then I want to engage you in what I think our biggest problems are and what we need to do as a society and as a country to actually totally capitalize on this opportunity that I would gather to say, when this uh, conference first started eight years ago, you were looking at a very different energy landscape than you are today. Uh, it would be interesting to see how the topics changed over time. Uh, and how quickly they had to change, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I just wanted to give a shout out to the Bismarck State College. I was just downstairs looking at uh, all the different laboratories uh, for the students that come through here through the community uh, college program, the two-year program, and the four-year program, and it spans all different types of energy, not just oil and gas, but electricity, transmission, distribution, R&D, nuclear, solar is really impressive. Uh, and I'll have to say we weren't allowed to take pictures because it is sort of a crown jewel. Uh, but there are a lot of other colleges across this country that could be benefiting from what it looks like here. So congratulations to the foresight of having this type of capability here. It's quite impressive. I promise not to copycat it, but I certainly can start selling uh, this, this concept more broadly. Um, I like to take a look at things a little bit farther into the future and then start bringing us back to today. In the middle part of this century, which is just 35 years from now, as I look across the room, a number of us will likely still be alive, according to the actuarial tables, uh, we're going to add 2 billion people to this planet. Seven of those 9 billion people are going to live in cities, and we're going to have a GDP growth of about 250%. That obviously has huge implications for the energy sector, particularly for the electricity sector, as we look at electricity demand to go up by almost 150%. So anybody that has a forecast that is uh, an energy forecast that goes out to 2050, I can tell you right now, they're dead wrong. Nobody can envision this type of change, which is conveniently why our own U.S. government forecasts don't even go out that far, because we can't envision the type of world we're going to be living in in 2050, 35 years from now. Let's bring it 10 years closer, 25 years from now. Energy demand around the world by 2040 is going to go up by over 50%. What's different now today is where that demand is coming from. It is not coming from the developed countries. It is coming from the developing countries. 90% of that growth from the developing countries. Electricity demand is still the leader, uh, going up by over 75%. And yet today, we, only, we still have 1.6 billion people without access to any electricity whatsoever. And if we're successful in closing what we call that energy poverty gap, even these numbers will be drastically out of shape. 
In fact, if you forecast out to 2035, our government believes that we will still have at least a half billion people with no access whatsoever to electricity if we are successful. And this, of course, is going to take a lot of money to meet this energy demand, at least $38 trillion uh, over the next 20 years to meet this energy growth demand. The question for us is how much of that $38 trillion is going to come here? Do we have the legal framework, the regulatory framework, the tax policy? Are we going to make it uneconomic in some way or another? Is people going to go to the Marcellus or Mozambique? Are they going to be in North Dakota or Equatorial Guinea? There are options on the table. And so even though we are blessed with abundant resources, we have to work hard to make people want to invest here. You've done a great job in North Dakota, and we're going to talk about what that means for the rest of the country, but we still have a long to-do list outside of North Dakota. The left-hand part of this slide is the developed world, and the right-hand part is the developing world. Blue is the energy demand growth. So you can see in the United States and the OECD countries, demand growth is fairly flat. All of the action is on the right-hand part of that slide. China is today the world's largest energy consumer. You know, the Chinese government makes policy on five-year increments. They, they live by the five-year plan. You learned that back in, uh, you know, in high school. We looked at different government, uh, the communist society, socialist societies, five-year plans. For the last four or five-year plans in China, energy has been job number one, and for good reason, with the escalating population growth and certainly uh, a big concern by the Chinese government of meeting the needs of their citizens so they don't get unhappy with their type of government. Energy has been job number one. They will continue to be the largest energy consumer for the foreseeable future. India is on here. Let's see if I have the next. India is a very interesting story. Largest democracy in the world, population growth exploding. Today they have 400 million people in India with no access whatsoever to electricity. That's the same as the population of the United States and Germany. 900 million people with no access to refrigeration. That means they can't keep their food cold, they can't keep their vaccinations cold. It has huge health implications for the largest democracy in the world. India has made energy job number one. Prime Minister Modi just came to Washington. We hosted him at the chamber for a lunch uh, prior to his meeting with the president. What did he want to talk about? What did he come to America to talk about? Energy. Needs access to energy for his growing population. They've made energy job number one. The other part that is really interesting about this slide, I know I'm a geek, I'm a wonk, I think things like this are interesting, but the story is interesting. The Middle East is the second fastest growing region for energy demand growth, the Middle East. So we've been through Arab Spring, Arab Winter, I would say I don't know what we are in, except for we know we are in a time of humongous change in the Middle East. And the rulers of the OPEC countries, of the resource-rich countries of the Middle East, are acting very differently than they did just a couple of years ago. They're having to spend more money in their own countries to meet the needs of their citizens, keep them off the streets, try and uh, dilute the tensions in their own countries. That means they're spending more of their own molecules to create new industries, new opportunities. That also means they need to sell more of their own molecules to other countries because they need financial resources. And the left-hand part of that slide is not their next customer. It's the right-hand part of that slide. So you're looking at what we used to understand as the global oil market, basically dominated on the supply side by OPEC in the Middle East and dominated on the demand side by the United States. And that nexus and that really clear and easy to understand relationship is now broken. OPEC is now looking to Asia and obviously the situation here is changing. But if we were having this discussion uh, even eight years ago, but let's say if it was the middle part or the beginning part of this century, we would probably want to go to the bar because we were looking at, you know, oil imports only going up, 60, 65, 70. We were looking at natural gas. We were running out of it. Uh, and that was a really bad news story. But we wake up in 2014, uh, and we are the largest owner of fossil fuel supplies in the world. Hundreds of years of, of oil, natural gas, and coal. Uh, we are now the world's largest natural gas producer. We are just about to surpass Saudi Arabia in terms of oil production. And this is going to transform our economy for the foreseeable future. I'm going to make an argument of why I think this is irreversible uh, for a couple minutes. And then I'm going to tell you why I think it is reversible. So I'm going to argue against myself. So the first part is why I think it's irreversible. Uh, you know, we've been through booms and busts before. I lived in Houston. I went to school at Rice University. We have a speaker from Rice coming a little bit later on this afternoon. Believe everything he says. It's a great university. Uh, not quite as good as here, but it'll do. Uh, you know, 
if you looked at the last boom cycles, it was Texas, Oklahoma, Alaska, very centralized. The benefits were very, I mean centralized, very localized. Uh, that, you know, the economy in Dallas and Houston was great. It was the boom, boom, you know, 80s uh, until it collapsed uh, when I was there. You couldn't drive downtown Houston because the crime rate was so high. Very localized benefits. But now you look at the shale place across our country, and it is, the breadth is amazing. And if you look at the U.S. Geological Survey, which does our, you know, government resource estimates, they used to do them and update them every 8 to 10 years. Now they're doing it every 18 to 24 months. Because our understanding, as you well know here, is changing so rapidly with the technology and the ability to see underneath our feet. But now we have 33 states that are producing oil and gas. Not four, not five, not a handful, 33 states. And the other 17 that aren't want to be in the energy business, but they're in the supply chain business, which is doing some really interesting things to their economies too. But as you look at this, and you look at uh, everything from Canada to the United States to Mexico, all of a sudden the gravity, the center of gravity of the world's oil market could start to shift to North America over time, which is a tremendously different global oil outlook than we've ever had before. If we look at what's happening around the world just right now, if you look at what's happening in Iran, what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Iraq, what's happening with ISIS, what's happening with Nigeria, somehow fell off the pages that were down supply significantly in Nigeria, what's happening with Putin and what's happening with the Ukraine, gasoline prices are $3.50 in Washington, D.C. You know, the American people need to appreciate why that is. A lot of it is because of what's happening right here, not too very far from where we're sitting. Uh, and that understanding will continue to grow. But as you look at this, you know, you know is anybody here from California? All right, good. Uh, so California, uh, you know, I wonder what we would look like as a country if they just sort of fell off into the ocean, right? They might, even though they're the self, seventh largest economy, uh, we wouldn't feel the need to replicate some of their policy experiments. But the Monterey Shale Play, uh, the Monterey Shale Play in California is the answer to Governor Jerry Brown's problems. Right? The, the government in California, despite their really creative accounting, is broke, dead broke. Uh, they can't pay their obligations to their teachers, to their pension funds, to anything else. The people uh, that are raising their tax rates and industries are leaving California, principally to Texas, thanks to the marketing by Governor Perry. But the Monterey Shale play would be the answer to his problems. He knows that. The revenue would be huge for the state of California, but he can't get at it quite yet. The state legislature is passing legislation uh, in terms of fracking regulation that might give a green light to the Monterey Shale play over the longer term, but that's an interesting conundrum for the state of California. So one of the reasons why I think this is irreversible is how broad this is now spread across our country. A couple of years from now, this map will be so out of date. There'll be so many more brown and yellow and pink uh, things on here that we can't even imagine. So that's one of the reasons. The other is, now I know, don't get upset, I know the North Dakota number is wrong. Okay, I know that. I know it, I know it. This is from June, but look how wrong we were. This was a June figure. We're in October and you're over a million barrels a day. What other industry is changing that quickly? But when you started this conference eight years ago, would you have believed you would have been number two today? I mean, honestly, I challenge you. I don't think you would have. I don't think anybody would have. Uh, Texas, of course, is number one. You're number two. California is still number three. Bad news story. Number four is Alaska. Uh, Alaska, I'm sure some of you have probably worked in Alaska. Uh, a great energy story, a great energy state, not so much anymore. Uh, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline is a couple hundred thousand barrels short of running dry. Uh, and the areas that they need to actually continue to explore and expand exploration are off limits because of federal policy decisions from the Department of the Interior. Alaska will continue to go down the list unless a policy change is made. You know, if you have this conference eight years from now and you're sitting around, some of you will still be at this conference, I would suppose, I bet you that those numbers are going to be very different and you're going to see more and more states added to that list over time. Let's talk a little bit about gas. Uh, again, looking at just sort of the pace of change. At the beginning part of uh, our century, in the year 2000, shale gas was 2%. Today it's over 30, and it's going to be over 50 uh, probably by 2030 rather than 2035. So that's what other industry has changed that quickly and is forcing the type of transformations across our country? None. And people are embracing change. Even the, I, I say ET is the new IT. 
Energy technology is the new IT. We are the new high-tech industry. People just don't realize it. You know, they think that, you know, these, they think of roughnecks. And they're like, oh, that's terrible, right? This is such an antiquated, what did what the president call it? You know, the, the, the fuels of yesterday. Well, we got news for you. This is tomorrow and beyond. You are the high-tech industry. And claim that mantle and claim it proudly. Nobody has changed so quickly as this industry. Now, the flip side of this is, is I was in government in 2005. I was the assistant secretary for policy and international affairs at the Department of Energy. Uh, and of course, in 2005, we had hurricanes Katrina and Rita hit the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I was responsible for the energy response for the government. I was not the trailer lady. Uh, and, but here I was in 2005. Uh, we had only permitted just a few import terminals. So what did I find myself doing? Well, first of all, everybody was outraged, including some members that were sitting up here, writing me letters about why didn't I bring down the price of gasoline because it was at $4.50. Well, what did we do? We released some oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Some other countries did the same. We stabilized the market in a pretty short amount of time, and, some, and production was back up in the Gulf in less than two weeks, and the pipelines were open in four. Prices came back down pretty darn quickly for the damage that that hurricane caused. What we were really worried about was not oil. I knew we had the tools in the toolbox to fix that. I was worried about this. I was looking at an extremely hot summer. I was looking at Europe that was experiencing a drought. They didn't have a lot of options besides uh, LNG tankers because they hadn't had a lot of the infrastructure built for Russia. How'd that work out for you? But um, we were really, really worried about this. So what did we do? We started to expedite the permitting of our import terminals. You know, there's a notice to DOE, you can expedite the permitting of export terminals, because we did it for import purposes. And then I found myself traveling to every place you will never go on vacation, begging people to sell gas onto the marketplace. Turkmenistan in August, Qatar in August. I mean, places that were just lovely. But we were in a, this is 2005. I'm begging for molecules and expediting import terminals. And now nine years later, we've got four terminals for export and more. Uh, what other industry has changed so rapidly? Steve Jobs didn't change things that rapidly. You guys are, and you should claim the credit for that. The other reason why I think this is irreversible is it has just fundamental employment implications for our country. We teamed up with IHS Sierra. Some of you may know that as Dan Jurgen's firm, the Pulitzer Prize winning author. He does all of our modeling at my institute. Uh, and we said, all right, Dan, we call this the shale gale, the shale revolution. How big is it? We don't have numbers. Uh, and doing the modeling, we found out in 2012 that already in the new unconventional plays, we had created 2.1 million jobs. And that was slated to go up to 3.9 million jobs between now and 2025. Now, that's a really important figure that I circled there because in the next 10 years, we have to create 20 million jobs in this country, 20 million, to account for the unemployed, to get back to pre-recession levels. Uh, for the unemployed, the underemployed, the people that have stopped looking for work, and the people that are coming into the workforce, those people you don't want moving home with you, those people, right? Uh, so if you look at that, close to a 4 million job down payment on 20 is a pretty good thing by only one single industry. So if we want this economy to recover, it is going to recover on the back of the energy industry. We just need the federal government to recognize that. This industry is the single largest contributor to jobs over the recession, and will be the single largest over the next two decades, if we let it, if we let it. The other interesting thing that we found uh, was the revenue picture, and we'll go through that in just a minute. So just a, a finer point on the jobs, this is through the recession, what was happening? This is according to our own government, I didn't make these up, that the oil and gas industry's employment went up close to uh, a little over 38%, whereas non-farm employment was down 2.5%. So this is the recovery. Imagine what our unemployment numbers would have looked like without this. We could have just about gotten into double digits during the recession, which would have had devastating impacts all across our country. The other reason why I think it's irreversible is everybody's getting into it. Uh, if you're blue, you're producing. If you're green, you're part of the supply chain. The darker you are, the more benefits you have. And obviously, there's some usual suspects in the blue category, but some interesting new suspects in the green category and getting greener. And by greener, I mean part of the supply chain. Uh, if you look at uh, Illinois, Illinois is the state with the largest supply chain fueling the unconventional oil and gas industry. That's interesting given uh, the, 
you know, the, the number of people from Illinois we have in Washington these days. Illinois is hugely benefiting from the oil and gas revolution across our country. If you look at states like Virginia, North Carolina, uh, those are states that don't want to be green, they want to be blue. They have passed in their own state legislatures the approval for offshore exploration. The federal government has said no. You look at a lot of these different states, they're going to be changing and changing and changing. I just came from New Mexico and Arizona. New Mexico would like to be a whole lot darker blue, and Arizona is desperate for any kind of revenue they can figure out. They even had to sell, sell the state capital. They are so broke, and now the governor rents her office back. Desperate to be in the energy supply chain and looking at New Mexico and Texas as an energy corridor down there as a way back to some sort of economic sobriety in that state. The other reason why I think it's here to stay is the Renaissance is just not about uh, Maria's from, ha you've got every one of the oil and gas companies here, but it's affecting so many other industries. You know, we used to be in the steel manufacturing business and then it all went to China. We're back in the steel business. We're back in the machining business. We're in all kinds of things that are remaking the industrial base of this country that we hadn't figured out how to reattract. It had gone and left and it is now coming back. And what that does for so many parts of rural America is amazing. I've spent a good amount of time in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. Uh, and the, you know, these are places that are heavily dominated by the coal industry, which is being shuttered, heavily dominated by the steel industry, which had left, and other types of industrial activity, which had gone to other places. There are places in Pennsylvania that people had left and weren't coming back to. You've experienced that in North Dakota. People are moving back to places in Pennsylvania. The steel industry is open, and oh, by the way, the state coffers are full in Pennsylvania. I was in Greene County, Pennsylvania, which is in the middle part of the state, sits right on top of uh, uh, coal facilities that are coal mines that had been shuttered. Now, because of the Marcellus Shale, they're up and running. Uh, they have more than one stoplight in town, but more importantly, the, the, the high school there, which never had a PE program, because why would they do anything? Okay, they didn't have any money, they didn't have a PE program, they have a new gymnasium and five PE teachers. Why? Because of revenue coming back into Greene County, Pennsylvania, because of the shale gas that they've developed there. Just an amazing spread of this renaissance winding its way throughout. So just to wrap up on that, four million new jobs uh, coming to America, two and a half trillion dollars of revenue. Now I say that with a great deal of humility coming from Washington, but that's even a big number for Washington. Uh, that is a tremendous amount of revenue and why the governors, and I was, you know, your, your governor is, is a great example of this. The governors and the states are leading this effort. That revenue is split evenly between the federal government and the state governments, basically, almost in half from our study. Uh, and so governors who have to meet and balance their budgets every year, unlike Washington, are looking to this as their salvation. Republicans, Democrats, independents, they love the revenue that this is generating all across the country. And it affords them to implement their agendas, that they will have the education agenda, the first responder agenda, whatever their agenda is, they will have the investment or the revenue there to meet it. Five trillion dollars of investment, that's a stimulus package I could get behind and it's not on the back of the taxpayer. It's back on a willing and capable industry to invest here. And of course, there's the added benefit that we don't have to import oil uh, from people that don't like us so much. Uh, and that's a pretty good thing. I've spent a lot of my career in the Middle East and I can tell you, I'm really excited about this from a geopolitical standpoint. Uh, it also, by the way, is the energy is the largest contributor today of reducing our trade deficit. Refined product, LNG when it gets up and going, coal, all the other things that we are exporting. It's the largest contributor to reducing our trade deficit, which is a really good thing for the U.S. dollar and the strength of the U.S. dollar. I don't know if I... So this is just the, the summary. The oil and gas sector created almost 10% of all the jobs over the last couple of years. Uh, we're decreasing our oil imports. We're seeing a manufacturing renaissance. We're seeing a change in the geopolitical balance. By the way, I would really, really enjoy doing the following thing, which will never happen, is pulling a tanker to the Gulf of Mexico in the next week, filling it up with oil and putting it on the market. Not because it would do anything to the price, but it would certainly show President Putin and some other folks that we're in business and we mean to stay in business and to start recognizing that we are now an energy superpower and we plan to play our cards. We're not gonna do that, but we're gonna talk about oil exports in just a minute. And then the last part down here in the lower left-hand part of the slide is the return of the chemical industry, the steel industry, and somebody mentioned earlier, and I'm so glad, the fertilizer industry. The fertilizer industry had moved to the Middle East to be near cheap feedstock, uh, and now the fertilizer industry is back. Now think of where I started. I said we're gonna add two billion people to this planet. They have to eat. Our farmers, who can now buy fertilizer closer to home, it's cheaper, will be a much bigger participant 
in the supply of food to 9 billion people in the middle part of this century. So it's good for our farmers. Who isn't it good for? Bureaucrats in Washington, maybe, but it is good for so many elements of our economy. I think it is completely irreversible. However, here's the problem. So if you remember nothing what I said today, remember your vowels, and I'm going to add one based on the presentation I heard this morning. Not make up a vowel, but I'm going to add Y, because Y <laughs> is sometimes a vowel. Uh, I'm going to make you give up bananas for good. I mean, I know you served them this morning at breakfast, but you're going to have to give them up. Uh, and you're going to have to get a prenup. So if that's the only thing you have to remember from my talk, we're good. Uh, what do I mean by A? We need access. You here in North Dakota enjoy such a tremendous advantage that so many other parts of our country do not. Let me just start with offshore first. Uh, the offshore parts of our country, this is the 2012 to 2017 offshore leasing plan from the Department of the Interior. If you're red, you're off limits. If you're blue, you are open. You can see nothing open uh, on the Atlantic, nothing open the Pacific, nothing open the eastern Gulf of Mexico, and new places in Alaska that are off limits. That's just offshore. Now, by the way, all of these numbers that are on there, uh, TCF and the, and the barrels, those are numbers that are 30 years old. The industries, you all know, have not even been allowed to go out there and do seismic uh, offshore in the OCS. We are just going to be able to go out there in the next year or so. Right now, the Department of Interior is drafting the next five-year plan, 2017 to 2022. At the moment, what's on the drawing board is an exact carbon copy of this. So if you don't like that, I suggest you get involved in the regulatory process to open up more of our offshore lands. And onshore, you know the story, too. Uh, so 85% offshore is off limits, and increasingly more and more onshore is off limits. 100% of the increase in our production, as you know, in the oil side has been on federal. I mean, has been on state and private lands, which means that the federal contribution to our oil supply, our oil output, is shrinking. Now, if you're offshore, the permitting time is growing, and you're getting fewer of them. If you're onshore, you just can't get access to them because they're not going to put them out for lease. And we're designating more and more of our national lands onshore as permanent conservatories and permanent national monuments. In fact, the president just did that in California. Another two million acres were put off limits last week. Gas, the story is even more dire. Uh, gas is down, uh, production is down 33% on federal lands, but up 44% on state and private lands. That's not sustainable. The federal government is the largest owner of our resources. And over time, and thank goodness, if you're a landowner, if you're a governor, you love this state and private land deal. Uh, but to sustain this revolution going forward, we're going to have to get more access. Exports, E for exports. On the natural gas side of things, the window isn't open just forever and as big as we want it. There are other countries involved in this. We see new supply coming out from Australia, Qatar, Indonesia, Algeria. You can see them all there, Trinidad. So if we want to be part of this market, which is why everybody's talking about DOE you know, speeding up the process a little bit so that we can actually get our, import term, our export terminals permitted and actually then secure the long-term contracts and construct it uh, so that we can be part of this market. It won't wait forever. So we've got to move more quickly to be part of this. The other side of things is the oil side, uh, oil exports. Talked about it this morning. Uh, this is going to be a very emotional debate in this country because most of us grew up with the overhang of an era of scarcity, not like the era of abundance we live in today. I lived in California, apologies. Uh, and I had to go with my mom in her big car, and we could only fill up every other day. Uh, and people, you know, that was born, most of our energy policy was born right after the Arab oil embargo. We wanted to keep the oil here. We did some crazy things to the natural gas markets that we've finally been able to unwind. But we're still living, for all intents and purposes, under the energy policy of 1970. We're going to have to export oil for all the reasons you know all too well on a daily basis here uh, in the Bakken. Our refining capacity, and by the way, the Department of Energy and the EIA, I think, I hope this is good, is about to come out with a study that is going to prove, at least from the U.S. government's mouth rather than somebody else's mouth, uh, that the export of oil will do nothing or, if anything, reduce the price of gasoline in this country. Something that our own modeling has proven out, but I'd like to have the government stamp on there. And I think that's what they're going. I, had a chance to talk with Adam Siminska the other day, and you know he's he's bullish on his study. He's also bullish, by the way. If you are, do any of you really follow the EIA forecasts, well, I'll just say they always have to forecast their reference case of what's going to happen, and then they forecast one that's you know the constrained by whatever reason. Then they do a, a high scenario, a high production scenario. 
He said, well, you know what, next year we're going to have to move the high production scenario is now going to be our new baseline. Uh, producing more and more here and in other places in Texas than we ever thought before. So their own forecast from last year is already dramatically out of date. The other thing we need is infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to add an I there because of where we are, and I, and I think I'll add it permanently going forward. But on the infrastructure side of things, you know this. It's the poster child of everything that is wrong with what we are doing. Uh, you know, the most studied piece of infrastructure, but that's, that's just, you know, that's, that's the narrative. We need a lot of infrastructure, whether it's rail capacity, barge capacity, pipe capacity. We need a lot of capacity to move these molecules around. Six years for the Keystone Pipeline. There's a transmission line not too far from Washington where I live. It took 18 years, not because they built it inch by inch. It took 16 years to get a permit for a 130-mile high-voltage transmission line and then two years to build it. Now, I can tell if you were in China, that would take 18 weeks. I don't necessarily want to be China, but, you know, Canada did something very interesting. They realized they wanted to be an energy powerhouse, that it was an important part of their economy, so they did some permitting reform. So for all big energy infrastructure projects, you go through the environmental permitting process in two years, beginning to end. That seems like a reasonable time enough for people to study it and then give the capital markets a thumbs up or thumbs down on whether the project's going to go forward. We're going to have to do something like that here so that we get some certainty into the market, that you can get some things built, move some stuff around, and give some surety to the markets that we're really in the business to stay in the energy business rather than it being just another boom or bust. The other I that I want to add back in here because of where we are is innovation. We talked about, I think probably Robert, I didn't get to say, we do a lot of speaking, I didn't see what he talked about today, but innovation, he probably talked about batteries and, and things like that. Innovation, where we're sitting, the laboratory's below us, right? We're going to need more and more innovation. Uh, we look at what's happening with the rig count here, we go, oh, the rig count in North Dakota is flat. Yeah, but they're getting more oil out, how'd that happen? Right? I mean, it's innovation, it's technology, and that's where we're going, whether it is in battery storage or getting more out per rig, whatever it is, we need more innovation going forward. And oh, by the way, that's another co-benefit of all of this, because I think somebody mentioned earlier, we will then export that technology and have people use it all around the world. So it's not just the commodity that we will be producing more efficiently, the technology will be another one of our products that we can be selling all around the world. The other thing we have to make sure we don't lose is public opinion. I think this is very, very important to know. Right now, we've got over 375 moratoriums on fracking, and uh, now it's 21 states. Um, some of them are in places where there are absolutely no resources at all, and it's just a political statement. Other places, it's far more serious. Uh, Colorado could have been ground zero in November if they had been successful in finding some way to put some element of the fracking ban uh, on the ballot, statewide ballot in November. There are a number of counties uh, in Colorado uh, that had passed fracking bans, and now they are in endless litigation with us and with the governor. Uh, and I think we will prevail. But if Colorado, which is an energy state, can ban fracking because of a small group of activists that are trying to convince people that it's going to damage their water supply, we're in trouble, people. We're in trouble. That's an energy state. Downtown Denver's commercial real estate depends on the oil and gas community. If they can be successful in Colorado, we're fighting right now one in Denton, Texas. It is going to the ballot. They did muster enough signatures. They could ban fracking in Denton, Texas, three weeks from now, three weeks from today, right? That would send reverberations across the industry. Of course, we have them in places in California, but this is something that we need to be very concerned about. We need to be in the truth-telling business. We need to show people that you can actually and are doing and have been and will continue to be doing it responsibly, that no water table has been damaged because of this. And we need more third-party people to be talking about this because I can tell you, you, know, you don't mess with a couple things. You don't mess with somebody's parking spot, and you don't talk to them about damaging their water because uh, that just gets people terrified. And, of course, we've got the added help of Hollywood in this and a whole lot of other people that are trying to cash in on this one way or another, we've got to be worried about this and be much more active on being the face for what this isn't. Uh, and we can do this responsibly. We don't need unfair or unbalanced regulations. And that spans everything from exploration production to transportation to the electricity side to the utilization of energy. We have an appetite in Washington that is unsatiable right now for regulation. 
This is the EPA uh, between 2011 and 2014, just the regulations that have something to do with energy, nothing else. I, I didn't even put waters of the U.S. on here. Okay, this is just energy, and now this is 2014 to 2016. How in the world do people know what to build, when to build, when will they not be in compliance, won't they be, what equipment should they buy? We're making it really hard. And we've got what I call in, in Washington, we've got the approach, you know, look, in industry, we've got to stop saying we don't want regulation. We do want regulation. We want good regulation. We want fair regulation. But what Washington has done is the pancake approach, which is they never remove all the underbrush. They just keep adding to it. And so now we're spending over a trillion dollars a year to comply with regulations that are no longer relevant to our economy. I'd like to see those trillion dollars invested back into the economy. But this is what we are dealing with. Uh, it's particularly coming to a head. Uh, on the uh, power plant rule that has come out uh, earlier this year from EPA, which will be finalized next June if they stay on schedule, which will fundamentally and potentially irrevocably transform our electricity sector. Uh, it has uh, gone into each one of the states and decided what your electricity mix should look like, how you need to comply with the rule, and every state is different. Uh, North Dakota, because you have an interesting mix here, you don't get off quite as hard as some of the others, but you go to someplace like Kansas, uh, they have to increase their renewable energy 260%. Some places the electricity prices are going to go up 40%. And guess who this hits the worst? An electricity price increase anywhere in our country, it hits the lower quartile of the income and seniors. That's who it hurts. It probably won't be, I mean, we're all going to be paying higher prices, but that's not who pays more of the, uh, you know, the, the penalty uh, are those two ends of the spectrum. So now we have this EPA regulation, some people know as 111D. Uh, the chamber here in North Dakota, Andy Peterson, a very good partner of ours, is very active. Uh, your governor has been very active. Uh, your attorney general has been very active. Uh, and we've got to figure out whether this is the right formula going forward. Do we want the EPA to come in and tell governors and state legislatures, here's what your electricity mix needs to look like in North Dakota, because we know better than you. I don't think that that's the what the Founding Fathers had in mind. There is a role for regulation, but we're seeing this intrusive market manipulation at the microscopic level of every single way we produce, use energy going forward. So this is what is a big, big problem. This is also, by the way, on the electricity sector, keeping capital on the sidelines, for sure, because they have no idea what to build. Uh, and if they're ever going to be able to build another coal plant again, are we all going to be switching to natural gas? And if so, oh, by the way, this affects natural gas nine years from now. Uh, and so the carbon content of natural gas today will not be tolerated in that amount of time going forward. So these are the coal-fired power plants that have already announced their retirement uh, starting in 2012 to 2016. You can see they're heavily concentrated up in Pennsylvania and Ohio. From 2016 to 2020, they move south. So everything east of the Mississippi will be covered in brown. They will practically be coal-fired power generation free east of the Mississippi in the next five years. And then it starts bleeding east, uh, bleeding west, excuse me, uh, as we look at more and more generation starting to be shut down. Of course, that affects our coal mines. I and mean, that obviously is something of importance to you all, importance to Wyoming, et cetera, which is the lifeline right now for the coal industry has been the exports. We're exporting more coal than we ever have in our recent history. Uh, in fact, uh, I find it, somebody was mentioning Germany earlier today. You know, natural gas prices here are between $3 and $4. In Europe, they are $13. Uh, electricity prices in Germany are three times as much as they are here on average, which is why you are seeing companies like BASF, the largest chemical company in Germany, in Europe, move to the United States. They might as well be an American company. Low natural gas prices, low electricity prices. But we are exporting coal. I guess who's the largest receiver of coal at the moment? Not China. Germany. Germany has 27 coal-fired power plants under construction today. Why? Because they need to lower their electricity rates in a big hurry because, as the Minister of Economy put it two weeks ago, we are today witnessing the deindustrialization of Germany because you cannot be competitive with high natural gas prices and high electricity prices in Germany. And the only way they have to go is coal, because they're getting out of the nuclear power business, they've over-subsidized their renewable business, and electricity prices went through the roof. Probably something we should take a look at. Looks a little bit like what, we, what we're trying to do here today. Uh, so we don't have to look too far, uh, except for across the pond, to look at the energy policy we don't want to emulate. 
And by the way, a lot of states are pretty upset about this EPA rule. 26 states have already said, you know what, EPA pound sand. They've either passed a, a state, legis the state legislature has either passed a, uh, a law that says we're not going to comply, governors said they're not going to comply, or attorneys general have said they're going to sue the EPA. So this is a roiling debate. Uh, and it is not going to be over in the near future. This will move into the court system and ultimately end up, I believe, in front of the Supreme Court for final adjudication. That doesn't do a whole lot of what we're going to build over the next five, six, seven, eight years uh, as it gets through this very uh, difficult, um, but you can see it's a very, very divisive rule already, and it's not even final yet. That doesn't go to final until June. The comment period, by the way, ends December the 1st, uh, for all of you that are interested in participating in that. What do you mean give up bananas? Uh, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. We've got to get back into building things. When it takes 16 years or six years, we've really got to be a can-do country to build things. You're building a lot of things here. Uh, but that's not necessarily true in lots of other parts of the country where it's so difficult uh, to get anything done. And you look at the electricity sector, we used to be building a lot of capacity at the beginning part of this century, now that's really slacked off. We're gonna be building some gas, we'll be building some wind, but for all intents and purposes, we're not building to the type of economy that we wanna see, because nobody knows what to build and if they can get through the permitting process. It's easier not to do it than to do it right now. It's easier not to do it than to do it right now. That is not the America that will be competitive in 2050 if that's the type of philosophy that we have to adopt to deal with this burdensome process, whether it be regulatory or permitting. Uh, and then last but not least, get your prenup. I know this is the permitting thing again, that's the only way I could get the nup in there if I had the pre, right? So forgive me. Permitting reform and nuclear power. Uh, you know, we have very ambitious goals to be energy self-sufficient and very ambitious goals to continue to have less emissions in this country. In order to do both, and to keep it affordable and reliable, we're going to have to have more nuclear power in this country. And we have 104 reactors. Some of them are shutting down right now because they're not economic. They can't compete with renewables. Imagine we have an environmental policy in this country that because we want more renewables, we're subsidizing renewables, that's making nuclear power less competitive and they're shutting down. I mean, that, that, that seems one at cross purposes with one another. But there are every other part of the world is building nuclear power today. China has 27 power plants under construction. Middle East has power plants under construction. Africa is looking at them. Eastern Europe, Latin America. Everybody's in the nuclear power, but it's obviously the Middle East is very problematic for us. And if we don't have an active nuclear power industry in this country like we don't have right now, you look at the power plants that are being built, we don't have windows. We don't have eyes into them. They're not using American technology, American parts. It would be really nice if we could see into those Iranian plants rather than them using Russian components, right? So this has huge implications from the non-proliferation side as well. But simply put on the energy and environmental area, moving forward to the middle part of this century, we're going to have to figure out how to build more nuclear power in this country. It's hugely expensive. We get that. Eight and a half billion dollars for a new reactor. Uh, and only going up because it takes so long to get through the permitting process. But that is an important part that we can't forget to talk about. We've got to keep the lights on. If, we are, if, if those that want to extinguish coal in this country are successful, we need other base load power, and it's going to have to be part of the solution will be nuclear. So I'll just sum up by saying, you know what? We have tremendous opportunities. You're living it. You're breathing it. You're showcasing it to the rest of the country right now. We have a lot on the table. We're either going to be the global superpower house of energy. We have to work hard to get there. There's a lot on the table. It's our national security. It's our competitiveness. It's our investment climate. Are we open for business? The Canadians don't seem to think so. Right? I mean, they couldn't be madder, and they're building left and right and everywhere else to get uh, new opportunities for new markets. Are we open for business? Uh, and we're going to have to demonstrate that we are. You're open here, for sure. Not without complications, not without needing more skilled workers. By the way, uh, when we talk to people and they complain about, oh, they're millennials moving, I'm like, S put them in a car and send them to North Dakota. You know, unlock the car doors and they'll be dragged out and put to work faster than they can even imagine. Uh, it's a good problem to have, a problem nonetheless, which you, I know you're working very hard to address. And I guess I'll end on the why, which I said was the, the, the vowel I was going to add, which is the youth, uh, which you're seeing here. And we look at, you know, you look at the, the population distribution here in North Dakota, and it looks like the barbell, right? You've got the seniors up here, and you've got the 20 to 25-year-olds here, sort of flat in here with a lot of people that had left. We're going to have to find more ways to involve youth in the energy industry. It has to be sexy again, right? Everybody wanted to go to Hollywood, then they wanted to go to Wall Street. Well, we've got to make energy really attractive again. 
uh, with you know, attractiveness to move into those STEM careers. Because for, you know, not everybody's gonna be an engineer, but for every engineer we graduate, China graduates nine. And so we're, we're losing that game pretty quickly. 50% of minority kids today don't graduate from high school. That is not a competitive workforce going forward. So that why the youth having that strong intellectual foundation, that skilled and unskilled labor will be hugely important to sustaining you know, the energy revolution that we are witnessing. Uh, I'll leave you with this. I think you should claim the mantle of success. I think this is a huge opportunity for the energy industry to rebrand itself as the solution, not the problem. For too long, you've been tattooed as dirty, greedy, nasty, profit-seeking, whatever you want. But by the way, oh, by the way, you're the ones that are hiring, investing, and innovating. Uh, and I think you should claim that mantle with a great deal of pride and help people in your neighborhoods and your relatives and everybody else understand that so that we have a nation that embraces this revolution and hopefully encourages our government to at least allow it to happen, if not get out of the way. So with that, I'm happy to take any and all complaints. Remember, I told you I'd ask you questions if you didn't ask me questions. And they won't be about football. <sighs> so, in my view, you know, there have been ample opportunities, I'll call them fig leaves, uh, for the administration to hide behind if they wanted to do this. Look at what's happening in the Middle East. Look at what's happening in Russia. Uh, you know, look how important our relationship with Canada is in the NATO context to what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, there's ample reason why they could have approved it. Uh, to now. Uh, they've said they're going to wait until after the Nebraska Supreme Court case uh, has resolved itself. It will resolve itself in the coming weeks, and then they will have another opportunity to make a decision. Uh, the reality is, whether it's called Keystone or something else, we're going to get a pipeline like that built. The question is just when. The reality is it will get built. We need it. They need it. It makes sense. Uh, right now, the, oil, you know, the, the rail industry has been the workaround. Uh, I've got a lot of investors in my institute, they're up in Canada, and I had one CEO tell me the other day, he goes, you know, I'm sort of in the oil business, but really right now I'm in the barge business. Because I get the oil business, I've been doing it my whole life, because I'm having to learn a whole new business. I'm in the barge business. They had to build a port in New Orleans. He said, I never thought I'd be in the barge business, right? Uh, so we're working around the problem. Uh, Winston Churchill said it be best, I'm gonna butcher the quote, sorry. Uh, Americans try everything else and then they get it Americans get it right at the end after trying everything else, whatever he said, you know, we'll get there. Uh, I just don't know exactly when. Karen, question on 111D and the EPA rule on coal. Um, we have one Democratic member of the congressional delegation that obviously would have at least a fighting chance of getting the president's attention or Harry Reid's attention in a Senator Heitkamp. Um, and, you know, she was here this morning and you can tell speaking of the administration as though they're on another planet, right? And she's of the same party, uh, so it's not an easy deal. But what advice would you have for what, 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 how could North Dakota use our one entree to the administration in these final two years and uh, uh, to Harry Reid, hopefully in his final months as, uh, as majority leader to, to, to get some certainty for the coal folks? Well, I, you look at what the implications of this are for, you know, not just the economy here, but more broadly. So 111D, which will you know, transform electricity, is the beginning, not the end. And this is what I think people need to understand, and Harry Reid needs to understand. If left unchecked, this goes to the next set of issues. The EPA has already requested from Congress appropriations for the next four regulations of our economy. Pulp and paper, refining, you go on and on. There's four more of these regulations they want to get out the door. So this was the beginning, not the end. Oh, by the way, then it's the construction industry is the last one. The construction, so everything you build will then be subject to EPA regulations and EPA permitting. You already have to do some of that, but every facility. So you want to add something here on the campus of Bismarck State College. You don't have to just comply with the local environmental regulations. You will have to get a CO2 permit from EPA. That will even affect Harry Reid's state. So I think injecting an element of practicality here, uh, and 
I have been trying, we have been trying, I think you all should try, is this is not about energy or the environment, energy versus the environment. I mean, you're proving it out here that we can do both. We're proving it out in America more broadly, we can do it both with our emissions coming down. This is energy and the environment. Uh, and no poor country is ever kind to its environment. So we need affordable energy to grow this economy on sustainable energy, which we have shown over and over again we can produce, that will allow us to be increasingly more creative uh, on, on our environmental challenges. So, you know, I think they have to understand that everybody's a willing partner in this, but transforming the, you know, the energy sector in five years when it, they haven't even making a move in six years on Keystone is pretty unreasonable. And that people want to be at the table, not on the menu. I mean, everybody here is an environmentalist. I want clean air, clean water, good use of our land. Everybody does. Nobody wakes up in the morning, not one of you or your board or your executives or your partners wake up and say, what bad things can we do to the environment today? Right? Nobody does that. We all live here. We want to be good stewards of our environment. So pitting us as though we don't want that is really, really unfortunate. So I challenge them all the time. I got into a fight with Senator Boxer in a Senate hearing about, don't tell me I'm not an environmentalist. I live here too. So, you know, we, we need to fight for the right of being environmentalists with the practical side. Somebody called it the other day the radical middle. I don't know if I'm ready to be a radical yet, but I liked the middle part, is that, you know, we need to be able to do both of these things. It's that, you know, that triangle that everybody talks about, energy, the environment, and the economy. If you take one of those legs of that three-legged stool out, it collapses. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the numbers matter. Uh, I know states are having a heck of a time trying to figure out what this means. Uh, we're available to help uh, you all here in the modeling and trying to help you understand what this means. And some states are, are decimated and others not so much. I mean, Texas, there is absolutely no way Texas can meet its goal uh, by the EPA. Uh, and they know that. So what if they, what if they decide? They said, we're not submitting a plan. We're not doing this. Sue me. That was their answer. Anything else? I won't ask you questions, I promise. Unless it's where to go to eat tonight. Well, you all, thank you very much. I wish you great luck in future conferences, and thank you again for having me here. Please, another round of applause for our guest speaker, Karen. My name is David Straley, and I have the pleasure of introducing the next uh, speaker. But before I do, I'm going to ask, as we've all been sitting for one hour, please just go ahead and rise up, get a little stretch in your body. Please go ahead. It's okay. You're from North Dakota, but it's okay. Just a little stretch. You can wake up your neighbor if they've been uh, taking a little snooze, please. With that, go ahead and sit back down. Dr. Ramon Gonzalez, the director of the Rice University's EEI, where he leads faculty and programmatic development of energy-wide and environment research to develop transformational and sustainable energy technologies. He has published over 60 articles in leading scientific journals, has six patents or patent applications, and has given over 100 invited talks. Dr. Gonzalez is also the program director at the DOE's ARPA-E, and Dr. Gonzalez has received his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Chile, a Master's of Science in Biochemical Engineering from Chile, and a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering from Cuba. Please help me welcome Dr. Gonzalez to the stage and to North Dakota. Was a picture of my daughter there, right? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I have the privilege to use my own computer, so if anything doesn't work, I cannot uh, blame anyone. Uh, and the other thing, I will try to stay next to the microphone here. Um, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to be here uh, to speak at the conference. Is my first time in, uh, here in North Dakota, uh, and my first time at the conference, of course. 
Uh, so I'm really excited to, to be here. Um, I think we're all on the same page. That's one thing that, we, that I have seen throughout the conference, and that's, uh, and that's great. As you can see in the title, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the work that we do at the Energy and Environment Initiative, EEI, at RISE. And I would actually give you a couple of examples as well of the work that I have done um, with ARPA-E. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the, uh, with the agency. And in both cases, the, the, the message is going to be revolving around how you use uh, an innovation-driven uh, research approach to create transformational um, energy technologies. And I would say, um, how do you get to a point of disruptive uh, innovation? So this is, uh, I think, uh, the biggest or more general picture I'm going to show you about uh, the research that we do at the Energy and Environment Initiative at RISE. Um, there's a lot of information there, small funds. Um, I have been with the initiative for uh, about a month now, so I'm certainly not responsible for creating this graph on the small funds, so I'm going to bail out uh, right away. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention to start off is that we take a comprehensive, multidisciplinary approach that doesn't involve just technology, but also business, policy, and um, one unique feature that we have is, is energy for humanities. We have the only center in the world that actually studies energy and environmental research in humanities uh, at, at RISE, and that's a very uh, important component of the, of the whole effort. But if you track up to the title, you're going to see that I have a couple of things highlighted there in italics, if you can see it. One is, is transformational, that word there, and the other one is sustainable. And those are going to be two keywords that I'm going to use throughout the, the conversation here. And actually, those are the two keywords uh, that are drive all our efforts uh, within, um, within the initiative. With that uh, in mind, and I, I should uh, point out that I guess on the transformational side, although I'm going to give you a little bit of an intro to what I meant with that, on the sustainability side, we tend, or most people tend to see the sustainability component as the environmental component of, of the story. We see that as in three components, essentially. Uh, the environmental component is there, the availability of the resource is there, but the feasibility, the value proposition, the economic impact of the, um, of the utilization of that resource is an integral part of that uh, sustainability effort that we, that we discussed. So the three of them together, that's what we're talking about when we talk about um, sustainability. So with that in mind, um, what I want to share with you today is, is a couple of areas here. The first one is um, sort of we are on the same page and I'm going to argue here that some of the challenges that Karen uh, mentioned, and, and yes, and the guy that she mentioned uh, from Rice, so thank you for that part of the introduction too. Um, so the challenges that she mentioned the second half of the talk, I think many, many of them can be addressed if we target the development of transformational, um, disruptive type of technologies. If we do so, we can address that. And we can, in the same way, we'll be able to achieve long-term sustainability of the effort. And those are the two components of the conversation here. You can see the two um, bullet points there. In both cases, I'm trying to illustrate my point through examples. I think typically examples work better than just uh, playing conversation. So let's go on to the first one. So why transformational uh, and disruptive innovation and, and how do you get there? I think the focus for research and keep in mind that I'm coming from an academic background in which I'm really emphasizing what is it that academia and institutions that are doing early stage technology development have to do in order to be able to make things happen. So uh, the focus on both innovation and impact is something that got to go uh, in that direction, otherwise we're not going to get there. So uh, what I'm going to do in this slide is for now empty, but it's going, something's going to show up at some point there. He's talking about that transformational and disruptive uh, characteristics of innovation. And I'm going to use the concept of learning curves to, to illustrate my point. Um, a learning curve as is going to be shown in this diagram here is essentially the relationship between the cost and performance of a given technology or a group of technologies over time. So you would expect that if you're going in the right direction over time, 
what you're going to have is a line that is going to decrease because the cost is going to go down and the performance is going to go up. And that could be in some cases with scale instead of time down here. So I'm going to use one illustrated example to tell you what do we mean by new learning curves and how we get to those new learning curves. And that is uh, personal transportation, basically. Um, cars, so how do, they, how do cars uh, um, came to be in, in the first place? So we start thinking about a learning curve that defines transportation by essentially horse-drawn car. Um, you can find or that actually happened in history. Um, as you move in time, there's going to be a lot of innovations that are going to move that curve down. Now, that is more a continuous type of innovation. That is not a transformational type of innovation or discontinuous one. So uh, you can think about putting more wheels, more resistant to um, whatever it was at the time, more horses. Then the, the word of more horsepower, is, it will come uh, handy at that point if you put 10 horses instead of one. Um, so, but how did car come to be, the cars as we know them today? Well, you can think about examples like the Cognat engine, uh, that's steam power type of engine, or the Benz motor wagon uh, that is pretty much the predecessor of, of what we know today as, as, as our vehicles, basically. Both of them were really innovative, transformational innovation, basically. Um, now, I want to call your attention to the fact that they are setting new curve there, but I'm not drawing the curve down too far. Why? Because I want to draw another curve that is the one defined by the four model T. And in that case, actually, you can see that the curve that is defined by that intersects the existing one. And at that, that tipping point is actually what defines the disruptive nature of that technology. And that's the type of thing I'm thinking about when I talk about transformational uh, technology and research that can lead to disruptive innovation, disruptive technologies in the marketplace. So you get to a point in which you have transformational and disruptive at the same time. So those are the type of technologies that we, and by we I mean those of us working at early stage type of uh, development of technologies are typically targeted. Certainly that's the type of technology we're targeting within the, uh, the initiative. Uh, and uh, as part of RPAE, I can speak on behalf of the agency as well, that's the type of technology that we target within the agency as well. That means that those technologies that we target are not going to be ready tomorrow. But after all, uh, from my point of view, we need to make sure that we're, we're enjoying today in the state, uh, state of North Dakota and other states in the country, the country in general, we need to make sure that we can enjoy that not for five more years or 10 more years, but 50 more years. And that's what we are keeping our eyes on. We're keeping the eyes on the prize, and the prize is long-term sustainability of what we have today. And I think these type of technologies will take us uh, in that direction. Something that has been spoken about uh, in the conference as well is the importance of collaboration. Again, from my perspective, I am thinking a lot about collaborations between universities and industry. And so I put essentially this slide together, and the bottom line here is there is something that needs to support this type of transformational research that I am describing here. And there are three main things that I think about when I think about what do we need to have in place. Of course, we need to be conscious of the opportunity and the challenge. And I, I, I rarely use the word problem in any of my slides or, or use the word in general because I think we should see those as opportunities and challenges and opportunities rather than problems. Even when we talk about solutions, uh, when there's a solution, there's a problem uh, that it came because of that, so, um, or, or in front of that. So opportunity and challenge, we need to be able to visualize that within academia and within institutions that do uh, uh, research. And the research could be fundamental applied. Whatever research we do, we need to visualize that. Impact, you need to be able to impact all those involved in the partnership or collaboration. Again, I'm talking about here academia industry, private sector, public sector, government, et cetera, the same thing is going to apply. Uh, the team, we, we talk about that all the time, right? Even the idea is going to come from people, right? So it's not just on the execution side that we talk about the team. The team is everything. The team is the one that creates the idea, the technology, and is the one that executes on it. Um, collaborating, you might think that collaboration between industry and academia is challenging because of 
perhaps opposing views. What is it that the university is seeing as really transformational or cutting edge versus industry? Um, I think at least for this context of transformational early stage technology, there's no conflict whatsoever. I wanted to emphasize that point, and uh, I was thinking yesterday, I just used this slide, I put it together yesterday, or last night, I guess. You all are familiar with uh, the Nobel Prize, and I'm pretty sure that most of you uh, know that last week those prizes were announced. Uh, so in general, before I thought too much about this, innovation and transformation of technologies and whatnot, I always thought about Nobel Prizes as, you know, Einstein, right? So someone who didn't invent anything, right? Now, it turns out that there's a lot of Nobel Prizes out there that have been given to people who invented things, not discovering something. And there's a big difference between innovation-driven research and discovery-driven research. There's, there's a big difference there. There's plenty of examples in the, in the Nobel Prize literature of those uh, cases, but this one is probably the best one. This is a Nobel Prize in physics, was given to a team of Japanese researchers. Okay, they say two Japanese and one American, but, but the American is someone who moved to US a few years ago, just like me, so um, I guess it's, it's, it's a Japanese team who won the prize. Um, and you see here is invention of the LED, basically. You are all familiar with LED, and the prize was given to the team that invented that. This is an extreme example of disruptive innovation, something crazy, cutting edge, forward looking, but it changed the whole thing. These get you into a completely new learning curve. Maybe I should have made the previous graph with this example, light bulbs and whatnot, as opposed to um, the automotive industry. But again, the point being, there is an opportunity today more than ever to marry those two things, cutting edge research that is close to fundamental research, but not quite, it's more like innovation-driven and impactful type of research. Okay, enough for that uh, conceptual part. So let me give you, uh, the second part of this, I want to give you a few examples of how that type of research could contribute to, le to the long-term sustainability of fossil energy. I was thinking, well, coming here, I can stand here and talk a lot about biofuels, probably more than what I'm going to talk about is. I have some experience with the area. Um, I can talk a lot about uh, the work that is done uh, in the university, Rice University, uh, and renewable energy, batteries, and solar, and whatnot. But I'm really, what really gets me excited these days, and someone asked me before, what gets you up in the morning, is looking at the fossil value chain, looking at the opportunities in fossil energy, and making those opportunities a reality in the long term. So long term sustainability, and how you can do that with, with technology. So I want to give you a few examples. It's going to be a mix between things that we're doing at RISE within the umbrella of the Energy and Environment Initiative and things that I contributed or developed at RPAE for, uh, for the agency. In each case, I'm going to point out, you're going to clearly see which one is ways. So let's start out with enhanced oil recovery and uh, unconventional oil. So again, you think about destruction, the percentage of oil that we're extracting in the back end is what? I, I'm not the best one on these, but certainly under 5%, right? So we don't want to keep drilling, drilling, and drilling and leaving 95% of it behind. So I think the opportunities that are out there are going to be so much better and things are going to be uh, so much better in general if we recover more than what we have today. That goes directly to enhance oil recovery the unconventional recovery might not be that relevant for the things you're doing up here, but they're relevant in general for these new, for this renaissance in fossil uh, energy in US and, and around the world. So let's get started with that first one. So um, left-hand side, I think most of you know this, so I'm not going to go too far into it. So out of barrel, how much do you get if you go primary production, secondary or tertiary production? Um, and this is more on the conventional side, as I said. You guys here in the back end, you're getting like what, like four or five percent. So it's, uh, it's, it's more uh, um, pessimistic than this number. But the bottom line here is if you don't go to enhance oil recovery, if you don't go there, you're leaving a lot of oil behind. Um, and that's really an active area of research for several groups at Rice University. And what is on the left is just 
description of what type of technologies are typically used in each of those phases of production. And I just wanted to give you an example of, of one of those labs that is working on the use of an alkaline surfactant polymer that is the one that is doing that tertiary or enhanced oil recovery. And essentially, when you, can, when you see here is sands with the little drops of oil there. And once you apply that alkaline surfactant polymer and you do the flooding, you're essentially displacing all the oil and you see how all of it can be recovered. Uh, this is essentially water flood uh, uh, type of process, the first one. And you can see how much oil is left behind and how much oil you can recover through these uh, type of methods. The same groups are working on a couple of other methods that I, I'm not showing there. One that has been discussed here and is the CO2 based um, enhanced oil recovery and the opportunities to combine that type of process, you get enhanced oil recovery, more oil out of the ground, and you are essentially sequestering or using that CO2 that is generated uh, at a different point by the burning of fossil fuels. That's one area that they are working as well. The other area is using foam, instead of surfactants using foam. As you can see that as an in-between, between the water flood, the liquid type of approach, and a gas type of approach that, that will be illustrated by, um, by the case of CO2. So in both of those cases, or those three cases, I guess, they're very relevant for, for the case of uh, North Dakota, and especially the back end, given the low recovery rates of, uh, of, uh, of the formation here. The second example here speaks about something that might not be that relevant for you guys, but it is relevant in general for unconventional oil. When you think about oil sands, heavy oils, etc., the levels of asphaltene on those uh, resources is pretty high, and that creates a lot of problems. This is a graphical representation there of the type of things you can find in a pipe or in any phase of extraction or transportation and the problems associated with that. And one important thing is, um, is not the solution, but is the beginning of it, is detection of those. So the way it's done today is in a very traditional offline analytical way. Um, with a large cost, large piece of equipment, of course, is offline. Um, the group that is working on these arise is having small sensors. You can see a pen there, basically. So I give you the idea of, uh, of what is the size of the sensor. Uh, you have the weight here and the cost, and these will allow you to do online measurement, basically. This, uh, this, this researcher is on the electrical engineering side of the of the spectrum, I find like in that discipline, people tend to talk about records and what is the smallest thing and whatnot. So I, I felt like I should, should put it there as the smallest uh, EPR uh, in the war, basically. So this technology is enabling not only for that, but for other uh, um, type of uh, application, not only in the pipeline, but in the well itself. Um, so let me move into the second uh, the second example, and this one is also very relevant and it has been spoken about here at the conference, is carbon capture. If we're going to continue, okay, I don't think that going about these by EPA regulating something is the way to go. But at the same time, it is a problem, it is an issue, it's not sustainable, and we need to find a way to capture that CO2. In what time frame? Technology and I would say economic viability of the technology, that sustainability umbrella that I was describing is the one that needs to determine when we're going to do it, certainly not regulation. But we cannot turn around and say there's not a problem there. There is a problem. The way we do things today are not sustainable over the next 100 years. That, that's, that's, uh, that's reality. So uh, there are two terms there, and I think you guys are familiar with both of them, carbon cap capture and, and storage or sequestration is a CCS, and then the U in the other one is utilization, and people have been talking more about that utilization as, as uh, essentially create a value um, out of that, uh, of that carbon. Here I'm going to give you a couple of examples, both from RPAE, and again, it's going to be labeled. Whenever it's RPAE, the logo for RISE is not going to be there, and somehow the RPAE acronym is going, to, is going to show up. So this is a portfolio that I helped manage. I didn't develop the product itself, but I helped manage some of the, of the projects there. Um, my goal with this is that you see that there is work in this area. Again, this is the same category of type of technology. This is very early stage, transformational. This is not for doing it tomorrow. 
is for doing it well tomorrow, if it is five to 10 years out, yes, that, that's what it is for, but not, not for today. Not to satisfy that EPA ruling or any of that. Not, not going to happen with this. So you, what you can see here, the total, by the way, the total investment there is about $50 million. Typical projects are about three years. And you can see a number of approaches that use solvents, membranes, urbans, uh, phase changing, interesting one, chemical looping. And they even funded some for enhanced oil recovery, so use of that, of that uh, CO2 for enhanced uh, oil recovery. Again, if you want to find out essentially what type of projects these are in specifics and so on, um, they are all on the website, uh, RPAE's uh, website. And of course, we're talking about essentially electricity generation, whether it is coal or natural gas, you're going to generate CO2, what do you do with that CO2? Of course, there is a number of barriers and that's why we don't have that in place today. Uh, when you put the U in between the C and the S there, the utilization part of it, um, the, the, the picture changes a little bit, so you, you still need to capture it. I just say you don't have to capture. There are technologies that are trying to bypass that. So use the flue gas director as it comes out of the back of that, of that power plant. But, but in the general scheme, you, you will capture it, and then you utilize it. Again, enhanced oil recovery, and I have seen some impressive numbers about if you do enhanced oil recovery in the back end, how much CO2 you will need, and, and the fact that probably you're not producing enough CO2 here uh, in North Dakota, so meaning that you're going to use a lot for enhanced oil recovery, certainly an attractive uh, case. There is a, a program that I uh, manage at RPAE as well, it's called Electrofuels. It's the general concept of electrosynthesis, essentially not just using the CO2 directly, but adding value to it by, of course you would need to input energy, the carbon in CO2 is in the most oxidized form that you can think about, so if you want to turn that into something else, if you want to convert it, you will need to input energy into the process, which of course cannot be the same energy you're getting out of, of, the, of this power plant, otherwise you will be fooling yourself, going in circles. Um, so th there is an opportunity there to have a finished product that is of a higher value. The trade-off is that in many cases, you're not going to store that, you're not going to sequester it, you're going to use it. And if you use it, eventually it will go up to the atmosphere, basically. So what you're doing with that type of process is extending the life of carbon. Your carbon footprint is still going to be much smaller than what it was before. This diagram here illustrates a little bit of that. So let me start by saying that that, that car there is a way to illustrate a car that is able to use electricity and a liquid fuel as a way to do calculations. The proposal here is not that you're going to necessarily have that type of car, but to illustrate how much you can get out of a given amount of carbon that you're extracting from the ground in terms of all the way to miles driven. The, the projects that I have been involved with are in general targeting liquid fuels as, as a product. So uh, the analogy is, um, um, is using a vehicle that will use liquid fuel and electricity. So the bottom line, what you, what you have here is that CO2 that is coming out of the power plant, if you have renewable energy, again, if you have energy from the same power plant, you just don't even think about it, you're going in circles there. But if you have renewable energy, you can turn that CO2 into a liquid fuel using electrosynthesis, electricity and CO2. And now the output of, of the entire operation now is going to be significantly larger. Actually, the, the inefficiencies are built into this, but you see that the two numbers here are comparable. So how many miles you get from this branch here versus how many you get from this side. So again, the bottom line here is you take CO2, renewable electricity, and you generate liquid fuel. So the output of your plant now is much larger, and that carbon is going to stay, I wouldn't say it on the ground, but it won't go to the atmosphere uh, um, in a much longer period of time. And that's represented here. So. When we think about the energy extracted per amount of carbon, it's going to be much larger, and the miles are going to be, that you're going to run out of that carbon that is extracted from the ground is much larger. No matter how you look at it, if, let me put it this way. If you put this scheme to a carbon, to a coal-fired power plant, and you do this, you're pretty much turning that power plant, that coal-fired power plant, into a natural gas fire power plant for the purpose of the carbon footprint. I don't know if that analogy kind of makes sense, but you're turning the carbon footprint of a carbon of a coal-fired power plant, you're turning that into the, the carbon footprint of a natural gas fire power plant, and that's going to meet all the, 
requirements if they are imposed in the end. Um, so those two examples are about essentially carbon um, capture and storage and carbon capture utilization and storage, if you get the storage in this case is, is just utilization. Couple of more examples. Yeah, I think I have the, the time for those two. This one is monetizing associated gas. This is one that I've been spoken about here for, for a while. Is an area that I have been working on for, for a little bit for the past two years, actually. Um, so I'm going to tell you very little compared to what I would like to tell you about this. So let's, let's go through it. So when you look at the natural gas energy flows in US, so essentially what you have here is total in the front end, and then you add up, and you're going to have uh, pretty much uh, the same thing on this end. And we're talking about quads there, so quadrillion BTUs, forget about the units, whatever number it is, in and out. And it shows what is flowing, what is happening with that natural gas. What are we doing today? So, I mean, you close your eyes and you say, okay, one third residential, one third electricity, and the other third industrial. And yeah, it's the same thing that you have here. It has changed a little bit because there's more electricity generation from natural gas these days than what it was maybe uh, a few years before. Um, but I want to point your attention to a couple of areas. Everything that you have here pretty much uses, uses natural gas, uses the energy in natural gas. The carbon is just, quote unquote, wasted. It's not used. The carbon itself is not the target. Um, when you think about this one at the bottom, does natural gas as a feedstock for fuels and chemicals. So you are interested on both the carbon and the energy contained in that methane because you end up with a liquid product. In the other cases, you pretty much end up with heat and electricity, et cetera. So we do very little on that. That's changing. I mean, these numbers are updated, outdated now, although EIA comes up with numbers. Maybe the 2013 are the most recent ones that we might have already. Um, this is growing. All the manufacturing sector in the U.S. is not just natural gas and being cheap and the heat and the electricity associated to it, but using it as a feedstock. You think about... The, the ethane crackers, for example, ethylene production and so on. Those numbers are going up, but still, if you look at the very top there, and that one is the flare one, is the, the one that is flare vented. The amount of energy that is going there and the resource, the size of it, is, is like an order of magnitude higher than what is used in transportation directly as natural gas in transportation. And is very similar to the amount that is used for as a feedstock for chemical production, pretty much, um, uh, back there. I don't know if you have seen that commercial from Shell talking about this pen soil that is made out of natural gas and how it's pure. No one has seen that? Every time I talk about that, no one has seen it, so I guess no one likes Shell. Okay, that's fine. Um, so there are more things happening there, but small markets. And then, again, we're flaring venting an amount that is large. The next slide, I don't want you to get, like, back, let me say something about the slide first, is this slide, and then you're going to say, no, I, it cannot be again, right? The flaring in, in the back and whatnot. I, I understand that most of that light is not due to uh, flaring, but still the slide illustrates a very good point, is the activity that you have up here, an area that is not, is not a highly popular area. So it's a, at least in this picture, it shows up very bright, um, and it, it shows there's a lot of activity up there. And certainly, we are now there is a given amount of that gas that is being flared. I don't want to concentrate just on the one that is flared or vented, but the total resource, and try to get an idea of the total resource. If you take all the associated gas, we, we just went ahead and ran the numbers. If you take all the associated gas and convert it to liquids, you will end up with the volume of liquids that will occupy, you guys were talking about the the Keystone XL, it will occupy about 10% of that pipeline. That's a pretty large volume of liquid. So the size of the resource, if you convert this to liquids, now when you convert this to liquid, the value, there you're adding value. The value, uh, the value added uh, there is really large compared to all the other applications in which you have direct use. Whatever that is, LNG, uh, um, all the way to direct use. Uh, of gas, so the size of the resource is, is very large, and I was showing the number, numbers before. So the program that I created for um, RPAE, and see, I, I lied here because I said that the logo was going to go away, but, but at least it says RPAE there. Um, this is a program that I created, it's a conversion technology. So you're converting 
natural gas, primarily methane, that is the lowest price component there, uh, to liquid fuels and chemicals. And this is a little schematic of what it involves. It could be either one pipeline or, or flare one. It's a bioconversion process. You can think about fermentation like when you make wine or when you make um, ethanol. And the process, at least we're highlighting a couple of things here that are really important for this to be able to get anywhere. One is the low capex of the process. It can operate at a small scale with low capex. And the other one is the carbon footprint is small. When you do a conversion process, you need to be real careful because you're converting things that are going to have losses there. And you're going to end up releasing a significant fraction of that as CO2, of that methane. So the carbon footprint of these technologies, the ones that are resulting from this program, uh, is pretty low. Actually, the next slide, okay, let me say first, again, the, the whole concept behind these is, as well, transformational type of technologies that can be disruptive in the marketplace, that are coming out of really uh, uh, innovation-driven type of, of, uh, of research, and of course, domestics, et cetera. But let me just walk you through this slide. These are just bullet points of, that tells you the characteristics of the technologies that are coming out of that. And it's a pretty appealing scenario. Now, these technologies are not available to date for deployment, they have been developed, but this is, this is in a way the promise of that. So if you do the numbers, with natural gas at $4 a gallon, a million BTU, you're going to end up with the selling price for a gasoline equivalent, keep this in mind, that's the cheapest thing you're going to produce, gasoline. You can produce higher value products. Um, it's going to be $1.50. So that, that's a pretty appealing uh, proposition, value proposition there. Um, now keep in mind as well that this is assuming natural gas at $4. It's not even the flare one that could be at a lower price, $4. If you look historically, I removed that graph and the spread in price between oil and natural gas and whatnot. But today it's like 3.9, and it has been fluctuating around that value. Uh, we have done plenty of analysis in terms of um, break-even analysis. How would the price, the change in the price of petroleum and natural gas would affect the viability of these? I would say ballpark number, natural gas, we could afford going all the way to $7, as long as uh, petroleum doesn't go under 65 or 70. So $7 per million BTU, 65 or, seven or 70 uh, uh, dollars per barrel of oil. So as long as you stay away from those two values, these type of technologies for a gasoline equivalent still uh, is, is, uh, is viable. Um, I have mentioned before, low capex. Uh, this is instrumental. If you want to deploy these at small scale, wellhead, et cetera, small resources, you got to be able to be capital effective, capex effective at small scale. And, and that's the, the type of numbers we have there. The third bullet point, the small footprint, small scale, I have, I have said before, is a mobile one. That's a uh, characteristic that was highlighted earlier on uh, in the discussion in the morning. So it would allow you to move around with it. So finish with this well, you move to the next one, and, and so on. And again, it's suitable for remote locations. Um, there's some numbers there of the scale and so on. It doesn't need to be a small scale. It could be at a larger scale. So you have a larger resource. It can go up uh, um, as well and maintain the capex uh, efficiency. And as any other process, as you go up in scale, it's going to be more capex effective. This is a really important characteristic here, design a product. You're not stuck here with a mixture of like waxes and diesel or any of that. So you can really, your engineering biology here and over the last 10 years, there are plenty of examples out there of doing that efficiently. Engineering the organism to do, produce what you want. That is an alcohol, that is an acid, is it a diol, is it one for butane diol, that is, is is a feedstock for the chemical industry, billions of, of tons a year? Is it one three PDO as DuPont has done for carpets and whatnot? So you have a lot of flexibility on choosing what product you want. And the last one, not the least, because I have been saying that uh, we have a big focus on that, sustainability. There are two aspects to highlight there. Um, I have mentioned before, is a clean fuel for sure, uh, or a cleaner, I would say. Um, small carbon footprint, I mentioned that as well, in terms of CO2 footprint. And here is another interesting aspect here. He's able to generate water. So when you're converting something like methane, that is a gas, to 
a gasoline type of product or a chemical is a liquid, you will need to burn some of that methane because thermodynamically speaking, for those of you who are thinking about thermodynamics, a gas to a liquid doesn't go well, right? So in tropically challenged process, you need to burn part of it. Then you're going to generate a little bit of CO2, and for sure, you're going to generate a lot of water. Some of those electrons go all the way to water, right? So generate water. Now, when you put that together with the characteristics at the top, you're generating water at the wellhead in a distributed manner that you can use for a number of things, including fracking. So we talk about the potential issues with water, et cetera. This is actually a good segue for me to get into the last part of the, of the conversation. I promise it's not long, it's short. And it's water management. That's uh, something that um, RISE has been working on for a while. It has a very large, strong group of uh, researchers working on that area. Um, and it's something that, as I mentioned, is connected to the technology that I just told you for the conversion of natural gas to, to liquids that generates water. So the one reason why I'm using my computer, I decided to stand here, is because of this slide. This is the only one that wouldn't show up back there. It's a lot of megabytes, so don't tell me that that is a bad slide because then I would have wasted my time now. Um, so what you see here is a water stress map, basically, the different colors uh, tell you what areas are stressed in terms of, uh, the, the way it's calculated, the water stress is how much water is available and how much is used, the balance between those two. So as it gets uh, red and darker and so on, things get really, really ugly, right? And then the little dots are places where fracking has been done, basically. And you can see there's, there's a few areas there that are challenging in the sense of fracking is taking place and the balance between the amount of water available and and, and, and use is a delicate balance. I don't, you know, I can do the same numbers that most of us do. How much uh, water does the golf course consumes? Oh, fracking takes less water than that, right? But the reality that I'm trying to show here is, is the balance between use and availability of water, regardless of whether it is for the golf course or for fracking. Um, now, the example I was giving before is, is one alternative in my view to address that issue and essentially is the bio-GTL technologies I was talking about, and you see the conversion there, the equation, the arrow, and water is generated, so methane and air, and then you get an alcohol and water, basically. So that water that is generated can be used in the place where it's generated, and the technologies that are being developed within this program are targeting wellhead type of, uh, of deployment. So this is one opportunity for uh, water management there, I mentioned that RISE takes a very comprehensive approach to, um, and, uh, to water, and there's no water generation per se, as I described before, included in this diagram, uh, but you see a number of areas where essentially different water streams are going to have different challenges from basically filtration uh, issues with membranes, uh, microbial control, so microorganisms creating problems, Example I gave you before is harnessing the organism or the microorganism to do something good. Here you have plenty of places where organism are creating problem. Actually, down here they are using a combination of biotech and nanotech to address uh, corrosion issues uh, and the NPS nanoparticles, so that's a combination of nanotechnology and biotech. So the, the bottom line here is, can you use alternative sources of water through purification of, of, of them, brackish water being the, an example of, of those? Can you recycle water and reuse it? How much treatment do you do before you dispose that water that you use in fracking? Those type of issues are the ones that they're, um, uh, they're uh, addressing there. Actually, this group is, is, um, is in the advanced phases of putting together a, a Senate type of effort uh, that will be funded by, among other uh, sources, by NSF um, at the essentially intersection of nanotech, biotech, but primarily nanotechnology for the uh, um, water management in the oil and gas industry, um, um, primarily. Rice, I'm going to go back to this slide here and just tell you there is plenty of things that I couldn't tell you. Um, so, Talking about visualization, imaging, high-performance computing, there's a lot of work in RISE in that area for the oil and gas industry. Um, advanced materials, I mentioned energy and humanities, conversion, 
Then I mentioned the efforts with the uh, School of Business, John's School of Business, and also the Baker Institute on the policy side of the story. So again, our approach is a comprehensive approach that take uh, essentially, uh, it has a strong multidisciplinary component, but the driving force in all the cases, I want to reiterate that, is, is the idea of using transformational or developing transformational um, uh, technologies, disruptive innovation that can then enable the sustainability of, of the energy industry. Um, we as, as an initiative have a significant emphasis on oil and gas. We have a conscious effort to not only make a statement about that, but invest in that area a lot, which I think distinguish ourselves from, uh, from other efforts uh, around the country. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to take any question you might have. Thank you. I'm making decisions here, I'm not supposed to be the one. It's a long hike, thank you. Um, thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, uh, I've been a utility engineer for over 30 years and the emission control, generation, that sort of thing. Quite interested in that. Uh, we hear a lot about, uh, maybe you're familiar with a TRL, technology readiness level, and uh, specifically interested in carbon capture. Frankly, I'm also uh, a utility advisor to some of EPRI's uh, advanced fossil technology as well as carbon capture programs. You may be familiar with those. Um, I'm curious uh, what your feeling is about um, capture technologies ready, readiness, especially uh, we hear from, I won't mention any names, uh, sources sometimes that technologies are ready for carbon capture, sequestration, utilization. Uh, I'd be interested in uh, what you think about uh, technologies that are ready for that, and also um, uh, if they're not ready, uh, <laughs> when you might think some are. And my other question would be, uh, as far as the ARPA E, uh, second question would be, is there a database I can go to for things that you're working on? Uh, little short summary of what's going on. Uh, people show up at our doorstep all the time and I'd uh, be curious to know uh, uh, your initial investigation on that technology and how um, ready you think that might be, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, in the universities, we, we, we do use the TRL level and, and RPI as well. Um, I think <laughs> at RPI they use it less and less because um, I think it's a fit for certain areas but not for others. So if you think about university, many efforts start like zero, TRL zero or minus one, I joke about it sometimes because it's borderline of fundamental research or basic research. Uh, RPI typically starts around two, I would say, and the target is ending with six. The programs, the projects in general, and the programs, the focus programs, are three years, that's the duration of, of them, that's the longest. You might get six more months or something like that, an extension, a little bit more of money, but not much more than that. So it's really hard to get beyond TRL uh, 6. So for universities, very, very early stage, and I think most universities, well, not most, the ones that are targeting this type of uh, uh, research, transformational, highly disruptive, high payoff, but very risky, they end up very low TRL at the end of the, of the projects. Um, universities in general, not all, but many, many universities are focusing on creating IP, and that is the avenue to commercialize. Uh, it's really hard to create know-how and, and trade secrets and whatnot in a university environment, right? So your people graduate and your secrets are, are gone. Um, so in the case of RPI, the, the second part of the question, 
where to, fi to find information. We have in the website, um, we can follow up and I can point you in the right direction, but essentially the website is going to have a catalog of every program, every project, and for each project it's going to have the RPE contact for that project and the lead PI on the project with the email address and everything. So it's, uh, I think the best way is, number one, just going through the website. Again, I can point you uh, uh, through it if, if you need to. And the second one is contacting the program director that is responsible for it at RPE, because that person can give you an update. Those, those uh, technical cheats, they are not uh, necessarily updated uh, every day. Um, so I think that's the best way to go about it. And from there, going directly to the PIs. People that are involved in those projects, they are highly interested on in commercializing what they have. So that they're going to be eager to talk to you about uh, potential opportunities. But we can follow up for sure. Anything else? Ready for the break? I want to take a moment to thank our silver sponsors for their sponsorship of the event. Lignite Energy Council, Metcalf Archaeological Consultants, Nesset Consulting Services, Next Era Energy, North American Coal Corporation, the North Dakota Petroleum Council, and the Touchstone Energy Cooperatives of North Dakota. I know you've seen all their logos going on the screen and we have many in the audience, so please thank them for their support of this event. And a big round of applause for all of our sponsors. I'm gonna turn the stage over now to Mark Nisbet to get us started for our next session on North Dakota's natural gas revolution. Mark is the North Dakota Principal Manager for XL Energy and is a member of the North Dakota Empower Commission and the North Dakota Economic Development Foundation. Mark will be moderating this session and introducing our speakers. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emily, and, and what a great pleasure to be here. I am a member of the Empower Commission, and uh, uh, this is a real treat for us to be here with all of you today. And I want to thank, besides our congressional delegation and the governor, We've had uh, uh, state officials, Lieutenant Governor Drew Wrigley here, Tax Commissioner Ryan Rauschenberger, Secretary of State Al Jager was here, uh, Ag Commissioner Doug Goring was here just a minute ago, and Attorney General Wayne Stenchum. So let's have a round of applause for those state officials. And uh, we are at the point in the panel where we're talking about North Dakota's natural gas revolution. And the three members of this panel are known for being problem solvers. Instead of looking at them as problems, they see opportunities when an average person might see a, a hurdle that would be hard to get over. We're going to start our panel uh, with Dennis Heider. Uh, Dennis is Executive Vice President of Business Development at MDU Resources Group, headquartered here in Bismarck, North Dakota. Mr. Heider has 40 years of energy industry experience with the majority of his time serving in various roles at subsidiaries of MDU resources, including oversight and development of production, pipelines, construction services, and utility operations. Mr. Heider has led numerous acquisition projects for MDU resources, including two significant utility acquisitions, and has developed numerous greenfield projects for the pipeline and utility entities. He is a liaison with economic development personnel in numerous states, both at a local level and the state level, performing community and state-related work. Mr. Heider has been on numerous energy industry and business development boards throughout his career, and uh, XL Energy owes him a personal debt of gratitude. When our Minot Service Center flooded in 2011, uh, Dennis was personally uh, responsible for allowing us to relocate our operations and uh, I share space with uh, the MDU folks in Minot. So again, when you talk about collaboration, uh, I, I see us working together much more closely, even in the future, Dennis. And thank you for joining us on the panel here today. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thanks for the emphasis on that 40 years of experience. It's, it's pretty good. Um, and, and it wasn't me so much in the Minot thing as a lot of uh, a lot of great people somewhere in the audience today that we have uh, working for the Montana Dakota Utilities Group. Um, I commend you for uh, if you've been outside for for being here uh, and, uh, and and sticking with it. I hope I'm not condemning you uh, by uh, 
by uh, keeping you here uh, that much longer. Uh, but we'll try to go through this fairly quickly. Um, and as I thought about what acronyms I could use today to confuse everybody, including myself, and volumes and all that kind of stuff, I, I kind of came upon the, the, the point of saying, do I want to use MCS, do I want to use BCS, do I want to use BTUs, do I want to use gigajoules, what do I want to use here? So I'm going to make this simple as I possibly can, mostly for my benefit. So in, uh, in North Dakota, what we're doing right now, we've got about a BCF a day of production that's coming in, and this is marketable production that's coming in to the various pipelines. Um, if you look at our numbers, you see that the wellhead right now, we're doing about 1.3 BCF a day. And uh, once you get through, we're, you know, we've got flare gas, obviously, with that. Uh, we've got shrink coming out of it. When I'm talking about uh, the, the BCF of production, I'm talking largely about methane. This is after processing. Uh, it does have some uh, entrained uh, ethane within it, uh, running a little higher than we normally would like at this particular point, uh, about 14 to 15 percent. Uh, ethane is a part of that methane stream. We like it more in the 5 percent stream. That's kind of a lead into what Bill's going to talk about with respect to the ethane situation and supply that we have. In the, in the Bakken as well. But anyway, we've got this BCF. If you add in Dakota gas, what they're bringing out, uh, that's kind of a large thumb of, of what we've got going on today. Now, putting that in perspective, what is a BCF? BCF is enough to heat about 11,000 homes, and that would be northern tier homes like we have in North Dakota, uh, 11,000 of those for a year. So that's a lot of gas. But when you compare that to the rest of the nation, it isn't a lot of gas. Uh, we consume on an annual basis in North Dakota about 40 VCF. So we cover a little over a month of this production by, con by consumption within North Dakota. And because of the makeup of, uh, of uh, delivery and, uh, and, and uh, pipelines, uh, not all of the gas in North Dakota is consumed within North Dakota. There's gas that actually comes in from the mid-continent and from Canada as well. So we've got a lot of excess gas. What are we going to do with it? Well, we've got to move it out. We've typically always been a net exporter of product in, in, the, st in the state of North Dakota. Um, and, uh, you know, that's been that way for a long time. Uh, Mark asked me uh, about a month or so ago if I remember seeing the flare on the Clarence Iverson number one well in 1951. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and the answer is uh, actually no, I, I, didn't, I didn't see it. So yeah, the, the well was producing and actually hooked up at the time I saw it. So uh, anyway, we're, we're gonna correct that flare problem. We're gonna have a lot more gas here in North Dakota, uh, depending on whose estimates you look to. This could double. We could be at uh, two BCF and not too distant future uh, coming in. That's running up today against about 70 BCF being produced in the nation. And that 70 BCF is going up as well. In addition to that, we're doing about seven BCF a day. And I'm talking annual, I'm talking the daily averages here. Uh, obviously, this is a seasonal, seasonal business. Uh, we have a lot of impact by, by weather uh, as well. So we use natural gas storage. We're blessed with being able to store natural gas. We've got significant storage in our area. Uh, in Baker, Montana, and that particular area is North America's largest storage field. So we're able to do a lot of swings to meet the winter demands for that. Uh, so we've got, I'm talking a lot of these on, on an average, uh, annual average basis, on a daily basis. So 70 BCF. Um, the dynamics have changed considerably in North America. Uh, five, six years ago, there was hardly any gas coming out of the Marcellus and Utica regions, shale play in uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Today, that's 17 BCF a day. It's dramatically changed our world in natural gas business. Uh, it's made it harder for economics to move gas. Uh, it's tough to move gas out of this area and take advantage of the big economics that we used to, and moving it east, north, south, or west is, is difficult. Nevertheless, we still have to move gas out of here, and we are blessed with uh, having a couple pipelines in the area, uh, a couple significant ones uh, in the green and, uh, and the uh, blue, I guess it is up there. Uh, the diagonal lines are the northern border pipeline to the further south and the alliance pipeline. 
originally designed to take Canadian gas into the Midwest markets. Uh, we're, we're able to enjoy now having the ability to move quite a bit of our North Dakota product into those, into those pipelines as well. In the maroon or red is the, the uh, WBI pipeline. Uh, that's a pipeline that's been around for a long period of time. It takes care of local demand in a large part of the state and uh, also interconnects and moves products to not only the west but into the northern border pipeline as well. So typically we move a lot of gas out of the state. We're going to continue to do that and that will likely always be the case. We're going to run up against a lot of competition as a result of that. So we've always thought that using gas at home is absolutely the best bet. And it may not be just the best bet, it may be absolutely necessary to ensure that from a natural gas standpoint and an ethane standpoint, that we are meeting the needs of not impinging upon the oil production that we have in the state. Uh, when we get into having the wells hooked up, no flaring, um, we're gonna have to make sure we've got homes for it. So we're taking that into an opportunity and, and that's a, uh, a, a huge opportunity. And over the last couple of years, We've done a lot with that. We've done things such as in Wapaton, hooking up a giant sunflower, a uh, will rich uh, in, in Minot, uh, a, new, a new customer, the lentil processing facility. Um, we're looking at now the CHS facility. There's another one being talked about in the Grand Forks area. To give you a magnitude of what that CH or CHS facility will use, they're gonna use about 30 BCF a year at that facility. We consume in the entire state about 40 right now. So that's hugely significant and it's gonna make a big difference. Still doesn't mean we haven't, we, we've gotta find a home for, for the additional product. So we've done a lot of these things. You'll notice a lot of these are tied into the ag business. Uh, and, and what a wonderful thing to be able to marry the ag business in with this energy business. And we talk about added value on the ag side, added value on the energy side. Both of them together do a tremendous amount of energy, uh, or excuse me, added value. We're gonna continue that. That's gonna be a big driver in help supporting both of our major industries in this state. Commercial obviously is coming uh, with, uh, with the influx of population. Uh, we're gonna have more demand from the commercial side as well. You heard a lot today about electric generation. Um, as much as we would like to see some coal, uh, really the clear line of sight is, is that new generation is gonna come from electric generation until at least we get these regulations figured out, which likely may not ever happen. So we're gonna see a lot of electric generation done in the state with natural gas as well. That's gonna be a significant market for us. Alternates, these guys will talk a little bit about, uh, about what they're doing with, uh, with the product, kind of non-traditional from what we've done before. We need to take a look at that. Some of that's also gonna come into the transportation market as well as we look at vehicle, vehicular use of it. That's probably a slower process, longer period of time, but it'll, it'll be there, I think, this, this go around. And then lastly, we're also looking at where else can we go with natural gas that we haven't gone before in this state. We've currently got uh, about 89, 89 communities hooked up to natural gas in the state. That leaves about 368 that aren't. Uh, Excel and MDU got together about four months ago, Mark, and decided to maybe take a look again. I, I will tell you, we've always looked at trying to hook up everything. If it was up to me, I'd have the 368 already hooked up. And since I've been in the business 40 years, I probably have looked at that a time or two through those years, unable to hook them up. Economics just haven't been there to do that. There's a reason that they haven't been hooked up and largely it's the geography and distance from the pipeline that they're at. But we wanted to renew our efforts on that. And so trying to see if we could maybe put our heads together with Excel at MDU, we decided to visit a little bit and put together maybe a little project to see what if we could do some different things, what would it take to enhance and uh, maybe get us to move additional pipelines into some of these areas that are not served with natural gas right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, this is also coming off the propane situation and not knowing what the coach in line is gonna do to that. Um, we wanted to make sure that we, that we were having uh, as much coverage as possible there too. So what you see up here on the map is approximately, uh, I think we've got uh, 21 communities, over a thousand people that aren't hooked up 
and an additional 29 communities of 500 and up, between 500 and 1,000 that aren't hooked up. So there's 50 communities here that we think we could largely take a look at and maybe get hooked up. It's, it's going to be a challenge, but we, I have embarked upon uh, the, uh, the studies uh, to see what we need to come up with, what we may need uh, from uh, a, a, an age standpoint, uh, whether that's a uh, new regulatory philosophy, whether that's tax incentives, whether it's to help the consumers uh, convert their, their uh, homes to gas. Um, we're undergoing that. We hope to have something done probably by the end of the year uh, to, to view, to see if it's, if, if it's even feasible for us to, to, uh, to, to renew our efforts on this. Um, you know, we've, we've had great, great conversations with regulators. We've had great conversations with legislators, with state officials. Everybody's been very supportive. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to happen, but uh, this is probably the best shot that I've seen that we can get maybe something done. So we'll we'll take a look at that. More to come on that as we as we evaluate the economics of of uh, uh, taking some extensions into some of these other areas. One of the reasons we'd like to bring this into some of these other areas as well is the fact that this is clearly economic development. Having natural gas at an industrial site provides an opportunity for the local economic development people to really have something to market. And we're, uh, we're really wanting to get them there because that'll help enhance that community in the long run. Well, very good, and, and thank you, Dennis. We'll <laughs> ask for questions at the end of all three panelists, and, and Dennis said it very well, but again, just to tie it into our Empower Commission, our 16-member commission uh, worked very hard on a document, and, and one of the things that we all agreed on is we should support incentives to expand the natural gas and the liquid natural gas markets, the idea being that we help the whole energy industry by reducing the amount of flaring in the state. So that ties in very well. Well, at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce somebody I haven't known, Patrick Hughes, but uh, uh, you'll think this is a great bio. It's, uh, it's a typical North Dakota story, and uh, you feel like you know the guy by the time you're hearing this. So Patrick, Pat Hughes is the founder and chief executive officer of Prairie Companies, a portfolio of growth-oriented businesses in the Williston Basin area <laughs> that support the oil industry through its companies, Prairie Housing Services, Prairie Field Services, Flatland Water Solutions, and North Dakota LNG, Prairie Companies provides a wide scope of services with best in industry operations. And again, as a key stakeholder, Pat has quickly become recognized as a solutions provider in the area known for his unique sense of urgency and the ability to get the job done. Exactly the type of guy we need in this state. Uh, please help me welcome Patrick Hughes. Thank you. So, uh, well, I have to giggle that I'm not sure everybody at my office would agree with unique sense of get her done. Um, well, thank you all for being here today. I second Dennis's comments about uh, sticking it through this uh, nice day outside. And I've come with two thoughts. One is that they've, they've left Bill Gilliam for last with the big announcement yesterday on your NGL plan. I'm uh, just uh, pleased for you. Congratulations. But more importantly, if you notice, they've kept these windows closed all day. So nobody can see outside. I'm sure that's why we're all here. So uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, the CEO of the Prairie Companies. I thought today what I'd try to do is really break things down into four areas give you a quick overview of our companies, talk about what we're doing in LNG, our abilities using LNG, and how they relate to the needs right here in North Dakota. Uh, three, tell you about the projects that we're doing today, and uh, one that uh, I can tell you a little bit about that's gonna happen in the future. And then four, I don't have a slide for this, but I was just thinking through the day, what maybe some of the challenges that we're seeing um, along the way. So I'll skip through the beginning because you kind of heard a lot about it. We have four businesses in the Prairie Companies. Um, the first business we started was Prairie Housing Services. Um, I showed up here in 2010 and with the idea of building kind of a ground game company to of logistics and support for the oil and gas business. And the first thing we built was an employee housing facility in Watford City. Um, that has 125 beds, and we use 100 of those for our own employees. And I think by the end of this year, um, 
we'll have all 125 of those used for our own employees. And we're big advocates of providing housing for our employees. Clearly, the biggest challenge that we have uh, is the employee game, and we, we just know if we can win that game that that'll be a huge benefit to us. The second business we have is Prairie Field Services. Uh, it's a trucking and logistics company. We have an asset-heavy model. We like to own all of our own assets. Employees are all fully benefited, uh, employees of the company. We do use some contractors when we see flexes in our business, but we definitely take the uh, asset-heavy approach. Um, and you can already see that without the housing, it's tough to have the logistics company. The third business we have is Flatland Water Solutions. We have two large saltwater injection wells, one south of... Uh, Williston, and one just south of the Little Missouri River. Um, and we couple those saltwater injection wells with you know, fluid processing centers, so we take all different kinds of fluids. Again, you can see the connection. We use our trucks to haul, and we house our people that drive our trucks. And the fourth business, the reason why we're here today is to talk about North Dakota LNG. Uh, North, we announced uh, the North Dakota LNG project in May of this year. Um, and I'll tell you about, you know, what we're doing, what we've done since we started talking about it, and kind of what we see for the future. Um, you can see on the map uh, where we're located. Our LNG facility is located in Tioga. You can see our two wells, um, and then flat, or the Prairie Field Services and Prairie Housing Services are both in Watford City. They really play off of each other. We have additional space at all of our facilities, so we can put trailers, we can put different... We can leave get loads of LNG at different facilities, so they really are, are starting to be strategic for us. Um, so let's talk about the customers. So we're using LNG to displace, you know, displace it and mix with diesel and other oil-based products. Uh, we've already started to do that, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we have underway. Um, we deliver the LNG, and it's stored on site, so we bring the LNG to the customer. We not only liquefy it in Tioga, but we own the transport facility, the transport trailers, and the trucks in order to bring the LNG to our customers. Um, we're already seeing a 50 to 60 percent uh, diesel offset in, in certain applications, and I'll touch on this a little bit of, on what we're seeing. Um, and although we haven't seen 40 percent energy savings, we think we can get there. We need scale, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we, you know, if you look at where the LNG plants are around the country, um, there's all different talk about all the different plants. There's some that are peak shaver plants, which are really owned by natural gas companies that need to have LNG on site to load the, you know, when there's a big load on the gas or demand for the gas, they reliquify the gas and put the gas in the pipe. But locating a liquefaction plant close to our target market is really, was really something that was important to us, and we're seeing the benefit of that in uh, reduced transportation costs. And more importantly, when you're in the oil and gas business, the reduction in the stress on logistics. I mean, we all know being in this business, you know, we don't need it, we don't need it, where are you? You know, when the, when the rigs are calling, no, we don't need it, we don't need it, well, wait a minute, we need three loads. So the logistics are... are, are are strenuous and having your plant close to where you're delivering is important. Um, and North Dakota LNG and, and, and it, we, our partners maintain extensive contacts with tier one companies. That's people that supply us gas. That's people that buy our, our fuel. That's partners on the capital side. It's partners on helping us find markets. There's people in this room, several of them, and we value those relationships and look forward to continuing to work together. And Here's some potential customers, but we'll get to the next slide. So here's what we're working on. We have, um, our, when, we, when we conceived of this idea a year ago, we were really after, at that point, we were really after two markets initially. One is drill rigs. Clearly, there's a bunch of them in the area. Um, there's a tremendous use of diesel fuel. Uh, they're all within a fairly small geographic uh, footprint. The frack pumping crews use more diesel. There's not, enough, there's not as many of them, um, but they're, they don't, you know, the, the, the consumption rate is really high. Um, the truck fleets, I don't know about that. 
Um, what I mean by truck fleets here is uh, heavy haul semis. And that's a tough one. I mean, for what we, you know, I've got, we've got 50 trucks. And people always say, well, why don't you, you know, convert your trucks? Well, there's a problem. We need a 15 liter engine in order to get the torque that we need to haul the loads that we're hauling. And the market's not taken on. I mean, I think it'll come. When you look at Westport Cummins results, they're really not very good. They, they've now put back the 15 liter conversion, or the 15 liter gas engine. So it's not going to come as quickly as we wanted. I do think, I agree with everything that was said this morning about fleets. I think that they're great, they're, they're potential LNG, but I think they're phenomenal CNG applications. And one thing to remember is, I, just because we have an LNG plant, I'm all for CNG. Um, I'm all for using field gas. There's a place, there's a use, there's a place for LNG, and there's plenty of business for us uh, if we concentrate our efforts. Um, the one part that I didn't see when we started this with some of these industrial applications, and, and uh, what I mean by that is working closely with people like Dennis at MDU. We're finding places where infrastructure is not getting built as quickly as anybody would like. The gas companies, the, the, the customers that want the fuel, and we can quickly put a liquefaction capability in a storage tank in for short duration, medium duration, or high duration. So that's one example. Uh, another, you know, the other example is the massive use of propane. I didn't get it when we started looking at it. And the amount of thermal BTUs that are necessary to support the oil and gas industry uh, is something that, that very much surprised me. Um, so, I'll tell you a little bit about our, our, our company. Uh, we built a liquefied natural gas production platform that will focus on markets in North Dakota and Montana. We're really trying to, t we got a lot to learn. And, uh, and we don't need to be running to places other than right here. There's plenty of demand. We're trying to build off our logistical infrastructure that we've spent the last four years building. And uh, we're really focused on, on supplying North Dakota with liquefied natural gas. Um, we have the ability to do a turnkey solution. So today, we have three applications up and running, and we've got another six rigs converted ready to take liquefied natural gas. So, well, I shouldn't say we converted them all. There's six in waiting to start using liquefied natural gas. Um, what I mean by, the, by turnkey, I, I like cradle to grave better, although the marketing people don't like that as much. We produce it, we ship it, we house the people that ship it, we converted the engines. We own the storage vessels. We own the people, or we don't own the people, but the people work for us that are on site checking those facilities every day so that there's no pointing of fingers around the, around the rig. And if you've ever been on a drill rig, there's always a problem. And there, one of the things that, that is important to me is to be able to take responsibility when the responsibility is ours and be able to segment our responsibility to make sure that the scope doesn't creep from the projects that we're working on. Um, small scale production facilities. The, so we have the production facilities, we have the LNG storage tank leasing, compressor, or the generator conversion kits. We've now put on three of those. Um, they're pretty good. They're not perfect. But we've learned a lot every time we've done them. Our, our, we're, we're, we're shortening the time between when we anticipate it'll get done and when it's getting done. That technology is going crazy, both retrofitting and the OEMs. The OEMs have a distinct advantage, but it's been cost prohibitive, and that's changing as we speak. Um, transportation services, like I said, we, we bought, uh, when we started our facilities, we bought six transport trailers and six what are called queens. A transport trailer is just like a oil hauler that moves liquid. It's just a big, expensive thermos, really expensive thermos. Um, a queen is a storage tank and a regas unit. So what happens is you make the LNG, you fill a tank, the tank goes to the site, it transfers it into what's called a queen, and that queen has the ability to hold the liquid and revaporize it into gas. So when you're using LNG, you're not burning liquid, you're burning vapor. 
The reason you, that you gasify it is, or that you liquefy it is, is because it becomes more dense and you can store just an incredible amount of BTUs. Um, existing local operations and strategic relationships. I can't emphasize this enough. Without our trucking company and the housing facilities and the people we've met along the way, again, several of you are in the room, I don't know how we would be, how we'd be doing. Um, I use the analogy, it's nice to make the LNG, nice to have a customer, but if you don't have the truck to fix the flat tire on the trailer every day, and I mean every day, whether it be an oil trailer or, a, or an LNG trailer, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of in trouble. Um, and then it just says we'll develop other plants opportunistically. Okay, so what are we really doing? Okay, so this is our first, this is just an overview of our first plant. So we built a plant in Tioga, and I'll show you a picture of it in a second, where we're using methane feedstock. So we're getting gas out of the tailgate of the Hess gas plant. Um, that, what started this whole idea was um, when Hess announced that they were going to expand that plant and take the ethane out of the gas stream, we picked this as, an ide as the ideal location. It, uh, we use, uh, this says Montero Williams, but that's out of date. I'm sorry, Dennis. MDU provides us with all the electricity. We have a very close relationship with them. Our liquefaction capability sits in Tioga. We distribute the first small bit of the fuel through World Fuel Services. We needed their balance sheet to get the thing off the ground, and they were willing to step up. Um, we transport it using our trailers, and we take it to frac crews and well sites. So we announced this in May. On September 15th, we started making LNG. And today, there are two rigs and one other site that are up and running. So where's the facility? So this is an aerial shot of, of Tioga. That's the Hess gas plant, obviously, and our facility is located just across the street. Um, giving a great example of a North Dakota, I mean, why North Dakota is great. Kathy Nesset owns that land. Kathy Nesset is a supporter of everything oil and gas. Great partner to work with and just has been, made this whole process, working with the city of Tioga, getting MDU resources to get us the power that we needed and to get the land right across the street. So that's our facility. But, um, here's a, this is a picture of it from the air. This is like, this is probably, I don't know when, maybe a month and a half ago. So phase one, we have a, we have a two phase project. The first phase is a 10,000 gallon a day plant. It's housed in that white building, in this hoop building right here. Phase two is gonna go in a, in a building right here. And that slab has now been paved, or been poured, excuse me, and, and our second plan will be 66,000 gallons a day, and it'll show up you know, on or about December 1st, and we'll be up and running by, by January 1st of next year. The way it works, uh, well, the infrastructure laid here will support both of them. So the gas comes from Hess. The electricity is already in place. Um, the tanks are going to go right here. Here's a temporary tank right here. That'll hold 16,000 gallons. There'll be 240,000 gallons of storage at this facility by, they tell me, there'll be 120 in 30 days and 120,000 a day after, uh, 120,000 30 days later. So by the end of the year, we'll have 240,000 gallons of storage. Plus we'll have six, so then these queens that are out in the field, they hold 16,000. So you've got another 92,000 gallons in the field, 96,000. So you end up with about 300 and some thousand gallons of storage. Hopefully it'll be enough. Probably won't be. Um, you come in the top of that, the trucks come around here, they come around this loop, they go across a scale, you sell this stuff by weight, and then they go deliver it to the customer locations. So phase one, there's, there's a picture of a queen sitting in front of a drill rig right here. Production facility is in uh, Tioga. Produces 10,000 a day. We've got competitive bids on everything. The pipeline with high methane gas is on site. Um, and we have a group of customers that have contracted for 100% of the, of the production. Um, and we've just got great relationships with our customers. I mean, the reception by the oil and gas community for a variety of reasons, some of them economic, some of them have been 
driven by economics, but willing to help to get an industry going. Um, it's just been phenomenal. The phase two will go on the same site as phase one. The facility will produce 66,000 gallons a day of LNG. Um, we've got a, a tier one equipment vendor with a Turkey EPC. Yeah, what's interesting about these things is they're bringing them in on skids. So by the time they arrive in North Dakota, they've already been assembled. And they always laugh at me when I say this, but I think they're going to set the skid down, we're going to plug it into the gas, plug it into MDU's power, and away we're going to go. I'm sure it won't be that, that easy. Uh, the same pipeline with uh, high-grade high methane, um, using the same infrastructure. And we have expansion capacity. We've already started talking about expansion capacity for this, for this plant. And we expect commercial operation in the first quarter of 2015. Um, so here's a map that kind of tells you what we're thinking in terms of where we can go. So that middle of that is Tioga. The, the denser blue is a two and a half hour drive and the outer one is five hours. And that's where we think our current market is. Um, we're going to build a third plant. And we think it's going to incre increase our, our ability to move product a lot further. That third plant's going to be a lot larger. And I look forward to talking about it specifically in the next 30 to 45 days. I wish I was ready to today. But it's going to be a lot larger than the two that we have. So a couple of, one other thing. What are the challenges? I mean, this isn't all easy. Um, and I don't have a slide for it. But you know, really, it's not capital. We have very fluid capital markets in, you know, in North Dakota, outside of North Dakota. The banking relationships have been phenomenal. It's not feedstock. Clearly, there's gas. Uh, whether you're getting it from Northern Border or Hess or Whiting or WBI, uh, there's clearly that. The local reg regulations have been great. Working with the state of North Dakota, I mean, uh, they were phenomenal to work with, and, the, and it didn't hold us up at all. I'd say there's really, there, there's two. One's markets, and we've talked about these all day. One's markets. I mean, having a little long, longer visibility and clarity on the national regulations of oil and gas would clearly be, clearly be helpful on the conversion side. I mean, you're talking about seeding an industry that's been inherently running on diesel or other, other oil-based products. Having a little longer, you know, an example would be fracking. I mean, it's how often do we open up the paper and somebody says, oh, we're going to ban this, we're going to ban that. Having a little longer runway would be helpful. Um, and the other, on the market side, is uh, easier access to Canada. Canada's got a, a more developed infrastructure, and they have more users that can burn um, natural gas today. And being able to go there quickly uh, would be helpful. Um, and then the last one, and we touched on it today, is people. And uh, it's a struggle. And uh, the reason I decided to come here today is I, I think the answer for us is, is places like Bismarck State College. What we're really looking for is technical people. We don't need extremely high uh, master's degree engineers. We need North Dakota people that want to live in North Dakota and that are trained in North Dakota. And uh, so I commend uh, uh, the Bismarck State College, and I'm, I'm here to support all their efforts. So sorry for being long-winded, but thank you very much. All right, Bill. Thanks, Patrick, and uh, uh, that's a very uh, uh, exciting story, and congratulations on your growth and uh, the Thank potential you. to really make a difference as far as this natural gas revolution. Well, we're coming to the point of the day where I, I bet you many of you are, are have been waiting for this, and... Uh, and again, this might fit under the concept of burying the headline, because I'm going to start with the, the sort of low-key bio that was sent before we knew we were going to make this big announcement. But then, then we'll burst into applause a little later. But Bill Gilliam has more than 40 years of industry and finance experience, providing a unique background for creating Badlands NGLs, LLC. As chief executive officer, his experience helped create the advanced Badlands business plan, building the company into a petrochemical enterprise which supports opportunities for Williston Basin natural gas liquids. Building a successful career in specialty chemical sales, 
pharmaceutical marketing, finance, and corporate development, Mr. Gilliam brings a diverse background to Williston Basin, seeking to capture the flared natural gas in the Williston Basin. Badlands NGL is rapidly expanding to meet those needs. Mr. Gilliam is a graduate of New York City Wagner College with the Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry and Biology and a Master's Degree and a Juris Doctorate. But at this point, I, I do think it, it should be mentioned that uh, plant is biggest investment in North Dakota. Four billion plant would convert ethane into plastic. So we're taking a, a part of this natural gas stream that could almost be considered waste or is being flared. flared. We're going to turn it into a valuable product and along with that to employ 500 people in this state. And so let's have a round of applause for Mr. Gilliam. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, good afternoon, and hopefully, I, since I'm going to be the last, I'll actually be able to open the windows and let you all see this beautiful view that I'm sure they're distracting you from uh, seeing because they want to make sure that everybody listens. Um, wh one of the things that I think is interesting when we look at uh, the presentation that Patrick just made, you know, he talked about being able to make CNG, LNG, look at all of these nice markets. The important thing was that Hess had to take the step of taking the ethane out of their gas in order for that to happen. And I think one of the things that uh, is a theme that I'd like to talk about this afternoon is ethane and why ethane is an opportunity and an issue and a problem, not only in the state of North Dakota, but nationwide. And I think if we can kind of look at putting in perspective ethane nationwide, reduce it to North Dakota, and then talk about what we're going to be doing here, I think it'll, it'll give everyone a perspective on um, you know, what the state and what Empower like to talk about, about value-added opportunities. So moving right along, um, topics. So who we are and what we do, I'm going to spend a very, very brief amount of time on that. And then I'm going to say that our starting point really has always been the Department of Commerce study that uh, the Commerce Department, I guess, authored and uh, IHS delivered to, uh, to you all uh, sometime in the summertime. And they said that polyethylene and polypropylene and some other things are viable businesses in this state. We agree with that. Um, I want to give you all an overview of the 2014 through 2020 U.S. ethane supply. Now, why is that important to everyone in North Dakota? M most folks here are going to say, well, you know, I'm very familiar with North Dakota oil and gas, but do I really care about the Permian or do I, do I care about the Marcellus? The interesting thing is it really impacts not just oil prices, it impacts ethane supply and demand and whether there are uses outside of North Dakota for ethane. So that's why we'll talk about that. Then I'd like to briefly talk about ethane production forecasts in North Dakota. And I may give you a startling figure that has to do with how much ethane is actually being produced right now today. Um, when we look at what IHS said, um, just as an anecdotal comment, um, when they delivered their report, they forecast that by 2020, that North Dakota would be producing somewhere in the range of 140,000 barrels a day. And they, they acknowledged that was a conservative number. What they did was they looked at the amount of gas we were producing, and they used a, an, an, an amount of NGLs in the gas equivalent to what's in the Permian Basin, about four to five gallons per MCF of gas. That's not what you have here. You have 11 to 14. And so, in fact, today, you're producing 200,000. Not in 2020, today. Finally, I'm going to just go over a couple of things that were talked about yesterday um, with the governor's um, press conference and everything and just mention what we're going to be doing with this project. So we are a privately held Delaware company. We're developing commercial uses for liquefied, nat well, for natural gas liquids here, um, primarily ethane at this point. Um, the founders include myself and Nathan Lowe, the CEO of Sunrise Securities in New York. With me here is our president, Mikkel Gerfinkel. Mikkel, why don't you... Stand up a little bit. He's a lot younger than me. He could stand up easily. <laughs> um, and finally, I want to make mention of one thing. I see some of them here in the room. We have a substantial number of, as I refer to this when I go to New York, um, we have a lot of shareholders that have 701 area codes on their cell phones. Now, when I say that in this room, I don't need to say where 701 area code is. When I do it in New York, I have to explain. <laughs> okay. Now. 
what happens to methane and ethane? It's sold as natural gas. So folks have oil wells, gas wells. It goes into gas processing plants. Highland owns some. One Oak owns a lot of them. Whiting owns one. Oxable owns one. And they process it. And the methane and the ethane go into pipelines. It's sold as natural gas. So ethane is not sold as a petrochemical feedstock. It's sold on a BTU basis. The Department of Commerce said in the summer of 14 that the polyolefin business was viable. And that was on a very low forecast of the amount of gas and the amount of ethane and propane. Um, the challenges here in North Dakota certainly include infrastructure. On the Gulf Coast, if you build a polyethylene plant or a polypropylene plant, there are purity ethane pipelines. There are purity propane pipelines. In fact, there are purity ethylene and propylene pipelines. There are hydrogen pipelines. It's all there. There's underground storage. What we have here are needs for some of those things, but I want to make sure that everyone understands that while we have a formidable task in front of us, you know, it's not as though we're bearing the laboring or starting. The folks that started fracking and doing the innovative drilling have established that you can do innovative things in this state. Folks like One Oak that have invested upwards of $4 billion on gas processing plants and do that with the state of the art have shown that there is the creativity and the capital resource available to gather gas and process gas. We are going to be an evolution even though the challenges of infrastructure compared to other places are there. The benefit here obviously is that we have a lot of ethane and that's something we'll talk about in a bit more detail. Okay, enterprise partners. Um, let me go back to last fall. We did a proprietary study with um, Bentec Platts, and they said by 2020, the United States was going to be producing 2 million barrels a day of ethane gas. That's from everywhere. Um, enterprise partners gathers a lot of gas in Marcellus, a little bit in West Texas. They said to a security analyst presentation in March that by 2020, 2.42 um, million barrels a day. Now, that's an awful lot more than 2 million. They revised that, though, and they said in June, oh, it's going to be 2.5 million barrels. Um, the most accurate number that we have right now, it's a proprietary study that's only partially completed, is that by 2020, there'll be 2.6 million barrels a day. Now, let's put in perspective what that means nationwide. Everybody loves to talk about the fact that, well, ethane is very cheap right now. It's being sold on a natural gas price basis, which is different than, you know, from the beginning of time until about 2010, 2011. Um, when Hess decided to build a, an ethane extraction plant, um, ethane, believe it or not, was at 75 cents a gallon versus 20 to 25 cents a gallon today. Because of the fact that ethane is as cheap as it is, there is demand that is being planned, forecast, announced on the Gulf Coast for upwards of 600,000 barrels a day of increased petrochemical demand. On top of that, in January, Enterprise announced that they were going to start exporting ethane gas to Europe, where polyethylene plants were using natural gas, no, oil to make polyethylene. Comparison basis, what Enterprise was saying is, if you make ethylene on the Gulf Coast in June of this year, it cost eight cents a pound to make if you made it from natural gas. If you made it from oil, it cost 48 cents a pound. Therefore, it was wise to move ethane gas to Europe. When this was announced in January, there was one committed customer. Now, that 300,000 barrel a day export facility is sold out. So let's add it up. 600,000 barrels a day of increased demand from American plants on the Gulf Coast, 300,000 barrels a day of exports, 2.6 million barrels a day of production, what is happening to the ethane supply that's going to be rejected into the U.S. pipeline system? The most recent number we have, it's going to go from 200,000 barrels a day in 2013 to a million barrels a day. Now, I actually discussed this with my friend Dennis Hader a couple of weeks ago, and I asked Dennis if he thought that the U.S. pipeline system could tolerate a million barrels a day of ethane, and I think your opinion at the time was very unlikely. We think it's more than very unlikely. We think it's impossible. So what's going to happen with the ethane? The answer, we believe, is more than 300,000 barrels a day will be exported to different places in the world, Asia, Europe, where polyethylene is not made with gas. It's made from naphtha, which is crude oil, 
it's a lot cheaper even though you have to export it and you have to put it on ships. Um, so we see that um, with increasing percentages, petrochemicals don't handle it. Exports are going to keep on going. The 1,000 barrels a day, the, 100, the million barrels a day of rejected ethane is going to have to be dry glass blended. Now, one interesting thing with this is, um, and we weren't aware of this really until a few weeks ago, if you look at the Marcellus, which produces a lot more gas than we do right now, a lot more ethane, that's where all of this export ethane is coming from. In different places where people are trying to shove ethane into pipelines, there are places where two to three dollars a million BTU discount from Henry Hub gas price is being experienced because of the fact that they're having to import dry gas to make sure that gas stays within BTU limitations. What this is saying is, if you're in the gas business, that ethane is a problem. It's not just a problem in terms of staying within limits, it's a cost if you want to stay within limits because you have to keep moving gas around. That hasn't happened here yet, but I think that certainly what the experience is in Marcellus would certainly say that that could be a problem here. Okay, actual June to September contents of Northern Borders Pipeline. In June, 70,000 barrels a day. In August, 115,000 barrels a day. Recently in September, 90,000 barrels a day. At 90,000 barrels a day, BTU content in northern borders was about 1085. You know, when you get to close to 1100, you're getting close to you can't have any more ethane in there. So what even last fall when we talked with Bentec, we felt that perhaps northern borders would have as much as five more years of being able to take increasing amounts of Williston Basin ethane. I think it's kind of at its limit right now. Um, certainly, when we look at the numbers, and we've done this two different ways, we looked at the actual production in different gas plants. Those are reported numbers. We've also looked at what we assume our friends at uh, WBI have. We uh, look at what Auxable says they have. We look at what Hess is sending to Canada. If you add 90,000 barrels to those numbers, and then you figure that, in fact, in, in June and July, the state's reporting that 30 percent of the gas was flared, you can add up to there is 200,000 barrels a day of ethane being produced in the basin right now. You can reject into WBI, you can reject into northern borders, you could export to Canada, or you can transport to Chicago. We believe that WBI and northern borders are at or close to their ethane rejection capacity. I'm, as I mentioned a moment ago, when you have dry gas blending, maybe you can get a little bit more into northern borders. The problem is, the model for this in the Marcellus is when you start resorting to dry glass bending, you're going to start looking at the netbacks to the gas shippers as being lower and lower. And the actual numbers are that in some places in Marcellus, it's two and three dollars a million BTUs below Henry Hub. That's, that's a big discount. Um, we believe that Chicago ethane demand um, is going to stay flat. And in point of fact, right now, um, Oxable Alliance bring gas to Chicago. They bring ethane to Chicago. Um, Lyondell Basel uses that at two plants, one in Iowa, one in Chicago. And in point of fact, um, as much gas, as much ethane gas gets sold as pipeline gas across the fence in Chicago as goes across and, be, and, and is made into polyethylene. One has to say it's kind of crazy to take gas from North Dakota, to take ethane gas from Canada, take it all the way to Chicago, and then sell it as pipeline gas. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but the point is it's full. There is no more demand for ethane there. That's not a good alternative to get for getting rid of ethane gas. Um, we also believe, based on the numbers that I talked about earlier, that if you have an incremental demand for 600,000 barrels on the Gulf Coast, if you have 900,000 total when you add in exports, that the thought that there's going to be an incremental market for Williston Basin ethane on the Gulf Coast, I think, is a stretch. So, what are we going to do? We talked about this a bit yesterday. We're going to build a 1.5 million metric ton, which is 3.3 billion pound per year polyethylene resin business. Um, we're going to do that either um, in the northeastern part of the state or in the southern or southwestern part of the state. Um, we have not selected a site yet because we don't know what the absolute, you know, optimum strategy is going to be for gathering gas. One of the th statements we've made to state officials is we want to try and be as inclusive as possible. So if someone's operating a very, very small gas processing plant or folks like One Oak or Oxable or what have you that are operating very, very big ones, we want to be an equal opportunity gatherer. We'd like to gather from as many folks as possible. 
Um, we have two strategic partners, Vinmar Projects and Technicas Rionitas. Vinmar is known to a lot of folks in the chemical industry and the petrochemical industry. They have participated in seven world-scale plants since 2000 as the product offtake uh, service provider. That is to say, for many, many years, they buy 100% of the product. Um, an interesting example of uh, a customer that they have um, in um, the Marcellus right now, Shell is talking about a plant and Brass Chem is talking about a plant, both world-scale polyethylene plants. We think only one of the two will get built. Brass Chem has a facility in Brazil um, for 10 years. The off-taker for that was Vinmar. That expired this year, and Vinmar signed another nine-year agreement. So they are considered to be, in product off-take, the gold standard. We have a long-term agreement where for 15 years they will buy 100% of our product and place it for us. Technicas Rionitas is a company that has $2.5 billion in backlog in Western Canada. Um, they are facing significant challenges there. They are a very unique engineering firm in that they do 90% of their business is lump sum, turnkey. All of their projects in Western Canada are on time, on budget. Um, in 2013, in petrochemicals and polymers, um, engineering, procurement, and construction, um, Bechtel, was the number eight company in the world, and Technicas Rionitas was number seven. Um, they are doing a pre-feasibility study for us right now. With that study, by year end, we hope to select the technology that we're going to use for making ethylene and then making polyethylene, and then also working with some other folks, um, figure out exactly how we're going to route our ethane aggregation system, which obviously leads to where we locate our facility. The technology and licensing decisions we're going to make by year end, as I said, under consideration, two major ga ethane gas to ethylene licensors and two major ethylene to polyethylene polymer licensors. If you look at the announced facilities on the Gulf Coast, uh, I don't want to get into the names of the folks we're considering, but it's, it's two folks for ethane to ethylene and two folks for ethylene to polyethylene. It's the same people that are doing all of those other plants. One of the really good advantages for us is, obviously, a key thing is when do you get your permit applications for air permits and the like? Because of the fact that we're going to do plants that are virtually identical to those that are being built in other places, we can get our technology and our design stuff done, we're told, within 30 days of when we select our licensors. Prior to year end, regulatory permits within 60 days. Maybe it's 30, but we're saying 60. We're going to start buying equipment before we actually have all of our engineering done, and in fact, even before we have our permits done. Um, we can say that, um, you know, it's going to cost between 4 and $4.2 billion to do that. Um, we believe that based upon the discussions we've had, I think Patrick said earlier, you know, this is a very, very, you know, hot area for investors right now. Um, institutional investors love master limited partnerships, which is what we're going to do for tax reasons. Um, we will not have a problem getting all the capital we need, and in fact, even the risk capital. We've had frank discussions with folks and said, if you're not interested in taking a risk on permits, then you know, you're probably not a good candidate. No one has walked away from taking the permit risk. We have a production goal of the fourth quarter of 2017. Um, two interesting things about that, number one, um, I'm, I'm going to use the following phrase. It's a very aggressive goal. Our engineers are saying it's possible, but it's aggressive. The interesting thing is it's not just that we'd like to get it done by them, but when we speak to the largest producers and processors of ethane in this state, they say they need to see two things from us. Number one, assure us that you can, from a financial point of view, get it built. And number two, how fast can you do it? And that certainly says that they understand that doing something with ethane is in their business interest. Substantial local use for Williston Basin ethane, that's a big deal because, as we've talked about, if you don't have a market for it in the natural gas system, and if you don't have a market for it on the Gulf Coast, the implications are you don't have any place to take ethane. One of the things that I'm sure we all understand is that the oil and gas producers do not think that shutting in production is a good alternative, not just because you can't find a home for ethane. Um, we will have over 500 highly technical and well-paying permanent jobs. This will be a new industry. Polyolefins is a new industry in North Dakota. Um, we've had discussions so far this week with colleges, universities, not just training of hourly folks and operators and the like, but the kinds of things that happen with polymer science, new applications, new developments. 
I and some of my colleagues and some of our shareholders visited um, a facility that's owned by Lando Basel in Morris, Illinois, a couple of weeks ago. They have um, two um, ethane reactors, polyethylene reactors, that um, were manufactured under a license from Univation, which is a, a Dow Exxon joint venture. Um, when those um, reactors were first put in, they had a maximum capacity of 100 million pounds per year each, just because of the changes in catalyst technology over the past several years. Each one of those reactors makes over 300 million pounds a year. So catalyst technology and applications technology is a really big deal. It's already paid dividends in this industry, and we think that the university system in this state is very well situated to work with us in you know, moving, you know, moving the line further, you know, and, and that, that's something that we very much look forward to. And that's my presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. And I know that we're going to all be taking some questions. Thank you. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have questions. Emily and Emily will make their way around. Uh, thank you. Question for Mr. Gilliam. Uh, are you planning to take uh, only post-separated ethane, or will you buy and receive Y-grade NGLs at the plant? Um, excellent question. The answer is we don't know. Um, I, I think that the one comment I would make is we believe at this point that the, the, the easiest thing to do is to do whatever the individual gas processing plants think is easiest for them. In other words, if they've got to add added capital or this or that or the other thing, it's not a good idea. We don't want to be in the business of doing other things with propane or butane or this or that or the other thing. So if we have to handle things other than ethane, we'll do it. We'll do it on a cost recovery basis. Um, we can do it. It's not a difficult thing to do. But I, I think that, you know, we've had some discussions with some folks here in the state, major companies in the state, about getting ethane to us. Um, we would, you know, we look at our business as taking ethane, making polyethylene, and giving it to Vinmar for them to sell. Anything we need to do on the front end of it is not a profit-making thing for us. It's a facilitation of getting the ethane. And certainly questions can be for any of our panelists. Well, somebody else is uh, working up the courage. Dennis, we talked about uh, uh, your commitment to trying to bring natural gas to some of the outlying communities in the state. Uh, what would be needed or what would really boost that effort? I, uh, excuse me, I think the biggest uh, thing is in the smaller communities is to try to find that anchor tenant, uh, whether that be a uh, larger commercial customer, uh, whether it's a school, hospital, whatever is available of that kind of size, uh, as well as whether there's grain drying at an elevator, et cetera. It's, it's really trying to get that anchor tenant. It makes it much more palatable and much more efficient than to move into the town to the, uh, to the residential people as well. Um, uh, keep in mind, I think, uh, again, one of the efforts here is economic development, and it is to provide an opportunity to get gas to those communities so that they, in turn, can drive some wealth creators and bring wealth creators into the communities to help them grow as well. Al Anderson also has economic development, so this dovetails rather nicely, so I can see him attracting businesses to those communities. So. So that, that would be a darn good fit. Thanks, Dennis. Um, Patrick, how, how big do you think LNG could be? You sort of talked that you're going to focus on North Dakota. If it, if it goes well there, uh, do you have plans down the road from that? Uh, we don't have any specific plans outside of... Uh, outside of the Bakken region. We've looked at opportunities that have come our way, you know, kind of tangential to here, and we continue to look at those, but we don't have anything specific. Um, and, you know, I think it's the, on the first part of the question of how big can it be, I mean, I think what drives 
at its core, what drives the opportunity is the arbitrage between BTUs of methane versus BTUs of, of something like diesel. And, you know, if you go back to the, people have talked about it all day, if you look at natural gas and you look at, at, at oil over the long, long haul, they traded very close together. And they've, that, that, that spread is blown out. And I think until that, that there's mean reversion where that gas either trades up or the oil trades down, that, that um, the opportunities uh, there and given, the, given a, a regulatory environment that provides you know, the kind of clarity you need in order to make capital investment, I think uh, um, the, the opportunity is very large. And uh, any more questions from the, the audience? Well, at this point, I, I just would like you all to uh, give a round of applause for our panelists and all of you for sticking around to the end of the day. Thank you. For sure. Thank you very much. Before I give the stage to Al, I just want to make a couple of announcements really quick. You'll be receiving a survey tomorrow from me. Um, we'd love to have your feedback on what you thought of this year's conference and your suggestions for next year's event. So look for that in your email inbox. Also, the PowerPoint presentations that we're allowed to post online will be available on the website in about a week or so, and I'll send out um, an alert when those are available as well. Next, I'd like to acknowledge all of the folks involved with our conference planning committee. They put a lot of hard work in this year, a lot of time and effort into making it a success. Um, part of our committee from Senator Hoven's office, we had Don Larson and Becky Dorman. From Senator Heitkamp's office, Joanne Beckman. From Congressman Kramer's office, Andrew Nias. From Governor Dalrymple's office, Jason Nisbet. From KLJ's office, Emily Johnson and Randy Tuminello from the North Dakota Department of Commerce, Al Anderson, and from Bismarck State College, we had quite the crew, Carrie Knudsen, Karen Selensky, Allison Zarr, Dusty Anderson, Cole Bernhardt, Jesse Carmen, Deb Mance, and all of our CETI crew. They're a wonderful team, so if you'd help me give them a round of applause, I'd appreciate it. Next, I'm happy to introduce our Commerce Commissioner who will help us wrap up today's event. Al Anderson became Commissioner of the North Dakota Department of Commerce in 2011 and has more than 30 years of leadership and development experience in business and the oil and gas industry. So Al, I'll turn it over to you to finish up the day. Thanks, Emily, and she kept it good and short and sweet, and I will do the same. Uh, first off, couple of things. We had a great group of presenters, of panelists, and a great audience. So thank you all very much for coming. If I look back a couple of years ago, when the governor's state of the state, he focused on people, places, and opportunities. So I'll, I'll do three quick ones on that. Opportunities, you know, one of the key things that came out of all the speakers were how important energy is not only to North Dakota, to the US, but to the world as a whole. And what a great place the shale revolution has played in changing that. And no, nowhere more than here in North Dakota. So what an exciting time it is for all of us, not only today, but also in the future, because you heard that with a lot of those value added energy projects that are being implemented or just around the corner. So it's, it's a great time to, to be in North Dakota. You talk a little bit about places, what a place North Dakota is. It has a model that works. Where else can you come and have all of the congressional sharing the stage with the governor in one spot and not talking for more than about five minutes, but answering questions? Uh, you know, that just doesn't happen anywhere else. So, so I mean, that's, that's excellent. And, uh, you know, they shared the stage. They were also very much aligned. Um, people is by far our greatest asset, our greatest strength, and quite honestly, our greatest need right now to keep, keep the industry going. 
Uh, and so, so if, if you just think back just a little bit, uh, eight years ago when this conference started, it was a completely different situation. It's all of the entrepreneurs, the innovators. It's all of you in this room that have truly made a difference, and I thank you for all of that because we're in a completely different place in North Dakota now and just eight years back. Uh, thanks again. Emily hit it with the, the conference committee. They were awesome. BSC, what a great place to have here. Sponsors, thanks to all of you. And I want to make one special thanks. You know, nowhere in North Dakota does public-private partnerships work better than here. We're a small state and everybody plays. I'd like to recognize those Empower folks that are still here. If you guys would stand up. These are, these are private industry commission. Come on. You guys, stand up. We got just a, there we go, come on. These folks give a lot of time and a lot of energy to helping develop North Dakota policy. And, and they aren't paid, okay? So they're doing it not only for, from, from their own standpoint, but for the good of the state. Thanks to all of you. Have a great rest of the day. What a, what a great place to, to invite tourism on days like today in North Dakota. Thank you all very much.